Ready to go? I'd like to call this meeting to order. Good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to meeting 28 of the Economic Development Committee. I want to uh, welcome members of the committee and uh, non-members uh, to the committee as well, and I'd also like to welcome the members of the public that are here in the audience. And for those of you in the room with us, we have a screen at the back. For many of you, it's on your left-hand side. This particular screen will provide real-time update um, uh, concerning where we are on the agenda and what is uh, coming up next. Uh, you can also follow us at, uh, at home or in your office or wherever you're located on your um, uh, computers, your tablets, uh, or your smartphone. And you can do that at www.toronto.ca backslash council. The Economic Development Committee uh, gratefully acknowledges that it is meeting on the traditional territory of the Mississaugas of the New Credit First Nation and the Haudenosaunee and the Huron Wundat. And uh, they have been home to many diverse uh, Indigenous people uh, here on this land. So welcome, everyone. Um, members, I will move right ahead to the agenda. We have a number of uh, speakers uh, listed here today. Um, are there any declaration of interests under the Municipal Conflict of Interest Act? Seeing none, thank you. I'd like to ask for a confirmation of the minutes from the March 1st uh, meeting. Councillor Grimes, all those in favour? Opposed, that's carried. Um, Moving right along, we will have, obviously, as I mentioned, a number of speakers, and we will add a couple of items for new business, Madam Clerk. Will that be added a little bit later on? Uh, our first item is uh, ED 28.1, uh, Mars Discovery uh, Innovation and uh, com Commercialization Hub. We have speakers with us, and we will get to that uh, momentarily. Uh, the next item, ED 28.2, Toronto's on-screen industry 2017 year in review. Uh, members of committee, what say, uh, what, we have a presentation, we'll hold that for presentation. Okay. ED 28.1, an update on the implementation of uh, Spotlight on Toronto, a strategic action plan for the film, television, and um, Digital media industry. Um, what, Councillor Grimes? You moving receipt on that particular? Adopt. Moving, adopt. moving to ad adopt the item. All those, Councillor Fletcher, that, visiting member. Thank you. Can I just suggest that uh, you are having the on-screen um, industry review, but some of those things would be part of that. So, if they could just be held and. Sure, and, and, and deal together. with them all together. Yeah, That's that fine. That'd be great. Um, and so um, uh, a member of committee will actually have to hold that for you. So, Councillor Grimes, I will ask Put you to hold together. that. Put them together. Thank okay. you. Thank you, Councillor Fletcher. That's fine. Um, we will do the same, I guess, with uh, 28.4. Uh, okay, Councillor Grimes, you're holding that as well. Councillor Grimes, you're holding up the agenda today. <laughs> uh, Grimes. Okay. And uh, ED 28.5, the nighttime economy, stakeholders, consultation, results, and next steps. I will hold that item. We have a number of speakers, and I think that uh, Councillor Cressy also has an interest in this particular item as well, so I'll hold it on my name. All right, uh, ED 28.6, strengthening running uh, tourism in, uh, Tor in Toronto. Councillor Frakadakis? Would you? I just got a speaker request right now. On what? I don't have the item. Oh, apparently, Council, we just had a request. Someone wishes to uh, speak on that. So I'll just hold that down. Thank you. I'll put it in your name, Council. Sure. Okay. All right. ED 28.7, the assessing and transfer of the City of Toronto's uh, Lancaster bomber. We have a number of speaker on the, speakers on this particular item, so I will hold that item. And uh, moving along, members, we have ED 28.8, appointments uh, to 
Business Improvement Area uh, Board of Management. Uh, what say Councillor Hart is moving adoption of the item. All those in favor, opposed, that's carried. Thank you. Uh, ED 28.9, the Economic uh, Bulletin. Uh, Councillor Frakadakis is moving receipt, or is no, that no, council? Adopt, adopt. Uh, moving, moving adopt, to adopt the item. That's, that's what we see. We're moving adopt. We're adopting Councillor Grimes. Councillor Frakadakis, you're moving adoption. Councillor Grimes is moving receipt, but I'll accept yours, Councillor. Okay, all those in favor? Opposed, that's carried. Thank you. So that's been adopted, received in Councillor Grimes' name. <laughs> All right, so we have uh, two further items, uh, members. Um, we have an item from Councillor Fletcher, uh, and I think you have, do you have copies of this? Um, oh, well, actually, we have to add it, then we can circulate it. Uh, options for arts and culture and creative industry space at 721 Eastern Avenue. Uh, move to um, add this item as new business to the agenda. All those in favor? Opposed, that's carried. Thank you. Uh, similarly, we have uh, an item from Councillor Layton. Uh, Councillor Frakadakis has taken carriage of this particular item. Uh, the item heading re-support for small businesses with cost of Toronto hydro wiring, wire covering. All those in favor of adapting the item to the agenda? Opposed, that's carried. Thank you. So those two items will be added to the agenda. And as I understand, I have, we have one speaker on the uh, wiring of uh, the hydro wiring covering. Okay, thank you. All right, members, thank you. We are moving right ahead. Uh, ED 28.1, Mars Discovery District Innovation and Commercialization Hub. Uh, Young Wu, Chief Executive Officer, Mars um, a District, Discovery District, and also Corey Mulhillville, Mul Mulville Hill. Uh, he's a lead executive, policy and uh, public affairs, Mars Discovery District. You're both here. Good morning. Good to see you both. Good morning. Yes, morning. Okay, the floor is yours. I think, Mr. You, this is your first time here, is that correct? Yes. yes. Well, welcome. It is uh, good to see you. Um, we're looking forward to your presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Michael Thompson. Uh, thank you, Councillor Thompson. That's good. And um, I'd also like to, to thank, of course, uh, you and uh, Councillor Holland um, for your sponsorship of the innovation file along with Mary Tory. It's been a great partnership with the city. And I do have to give a shout out, of course, to uh, Councillor, who's not here right now, Jill Cressy, who's uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm part of that board as well, and, and Councillor Kristen Tang Wong. Uh, we'll thank you. I think Marge is in. Um, do I have about 10 minutes to, yes. to talk? Yep. Great. Okay. Um, I think maybe the best way to start is to give you a bit of backgrounder on who the heck I am and uh, maybe move from there into uh, a bit of a Mars briefing and then open up for some questions. Is that a fair way to kind of break it down? That's the way we proceed, yes. Okay, great. So a bit about me. Um, before starting at Mars, um, I was happily retired. Um, I, most would call me a compulsive entrepreneur. I call myself a serial entrepreneur. Um, I'm originally an immigrant to Canada um, from Taiwan and um, uh, basically won the lottery when my father uh, decided to come to Canada and uh, basically based out of Toronto um, we left a dictatorship in Taiwan at the time. And the reason I go through that, a bit of that story is I think that kind of defines much of the entrepreneurial spirit. You have nothing to lose and everything to gain. And when you come from a place that's outside of Canada, you actually understand the value of what this country and what this city has to offer. Um, so uh, very proud of the immigrant experience. Um, and I think that defines, uh, you know, with a city that has over 50% of its population coming from outside of Canada, there's a huge uh, hunger to build and to give back um, to a place like this. I've raised uh, about $100 million in my own companies, uh, built five different companies. Uh, the first one started with my credit cards. Um, it became uh, Oracle Financial Services with 400 people by the time that was all done. And the last one uh, was in the mobile analytics space. Uh, we ended up uh, inadvertently powering Pokemon Go, uh, melted down servers from coast to coast when that happened and got to about a billion monthly active users. Uh, that's when I decided to retire after the five companies. Um, and uh, when Mars came calling, my wife said, you know, Young, this is the one thing you have to go back and do. 
Uh, what defines, um, I think, entrepreneurs is the desire to make a difference, and the opportunity at Mars is to basically make a difference for this city um, and uh, the province and the country that I think I owe everything to, so I really appreciate the opportunity. So let's talk a bit about Mars. Um, there's a couple of things that I think everybody knows about Toronto. Um, it is the fourth largest city in North America at this point, um, and, uh, and obviously it is an absolute destination, and it's um, a rising tide here in Toronto. But if I can break this down into what is the innovation file within Toronto and talk a bit about that. Um, the, uh, Toronto uh, is, is also the home of the third most technology jobs in North America right now. Um, CBRE recently did a study uh, in 2017 ranking Toronto as the top technology market um, in North America. We created 22,500 tech jobs last year. Uh, that is more than both San Francisco uh, and New York City put together. Um, so essentially Toronto right now leads in terms of job creation in the tech sector. Um, we're ranked the number five city in the world for innovation opportunity by PricewaterhouseCoopers. Uh, this uh, basically is, uh, Toronto is behind London, San Francisco, Paris, and Amsterdam, but of note, we are ahead of New York City, LA, Tokyo, Sydney, and Chicago, according to I think a diverse study done by PwC on quality of life, on innovation, on talent, and many other factors that drive um, the experience over here. So let's go to uh, uh, why Mars within the innovation economy in Toronto. Scale matters, and Mars um, has 1.5 million square feet of innovation-focused uh, companies and innovators and researchers and scientists. Um, we all know the story of Mars um, uh, has taken place over quite a few years, but I'm really proud to report that at this point in time, we have less than a 3% vacancy rate within that campus. Um, and according to JLL, uh, their global report uh, says that we now have the lowest vacancy rate uh, in the lowest vacancy rate city in the world, next only to Tokyo. So I think there's been some great advances as far as this particular file goes. We are the largest urban innovation hub in North America, and by most accounts, in the world. Um, so uh, the only reason I won't definitively say that we are the largest in the world at all times is because China can basically designate a city anytime it wishes to be an innovation hub. But by every single other measure, we are the largest in the world. Um, as far as being an engine for economic growth and impact, scale matters. Uh, we have scale, and we are now as a result of that scale, a significant destination for all of the elements of the innovation supply chain. So as an entrepreneur, when I was, uh, you know, whether it's from my credit cards originally to the $100 million in financing over those five companies, we always had the same issues in the supply chain. Could we get sufficient global sources of capital? In fact, could we get sufficient global sources of talent? And then beyond that, could we get sufficient sources of global partners so that we could grow globally, not just regionally? These were the three elements that were the hardest things to crack. And because Mars has scale, uh, we are now a destination for all of the elements of that innovation supply chain. We connect all the dots for entrepreneurs. And this is why this is such an important file for Toronto from a growth point of view, and it's such an important file for Canada from an innovation point of view. Let's move to uh, the supply chain that I talked about. Um, what you see here is usually the, the logo soup that you always see when you, you, you get to these presentations. It shouldn't actually be allocated into three blocks that are equal in size. Um, the, the voiceover on this is that we have 1,200 companies that we basically advise and see in the Mars ecosystem. 800 of these companies are startups, 300 are grows. By grows, I mean they're already doing somewhere between $1 million to $5 million in net revenues, growing somewhere close to 100% per year. And then finally, we have about 100 scale-ups. Now, scale-ups I would define as somewhere between $5 million to $50 million in net revenue, several hundred employees, growing 50% per year. Um, and as an entrepreneur and as an investor, I can report that less than one in 1,500 companies ever gets to be in a position to be scale. So if you think about 
our opportunity to back winners, and you look at just this one category of the scale-ups that Mars advises and sees. Um, you know, the, the, in the United States, you talk about unicorn development. Maybe over here we should talk about narwhal development. But this is the category right here. And on very simple back of the envelope venture math, I would basically peg the imputed market capitalization of the 100 scale-ups here today before their liquidity event at somewhere between five to seven billion dollars. That's not pocket change. What that also means is that they need capital, they need talent, and they need global partners in order to get to the next stage, in order to win on a global stage. And again, using very simple uh, venture math, I would say that they're gonna be seeking one to two billion dollars in capital over the next 24 plus months. So we have to be prepared. This is how we lose companies if we can't satisfy the innovation supply chain that they need because they will go wherever they need to go in order to basically get the resources they need because they're all trying to win on a global stage. There are 6,000 innovators that literally walk in and out of this campus every single day. 60 global corporate partners are attracted, are active, are working with our startups in our campus. We have 50 venture capital partners, only 10 to 15 are Canadian. So uh, Toronto by far exceeds every other region in Canada in terms of total venture capital raised. Um, we have, uh, since uh, we've been tracking this, um, tracked $3.5 billion of capital raised for our ventures. We have tracked $1.8 billion in revenues that have been generated by our ventures. Just last year in 2017, approximately $860 million raised in terms of capital. So by far, Toronto basically exceeds head and shoulders any other region. Now, you know, I'm, I, I'd like to say, hey, Mars is the reason why. It is part of the reason why, but Toronto is having a moment right now, and we're very happy to be riding the wave of Toronto as well. I think that defines the, the partnership between Toronto and Mars and how we can collectively win globally. Um, let me talk a bit about uh, life at Mars. Um, if you look at the stats on this particular chart, I think it shows Mars being an innovation showcase. So the other thing is in addition to backing winners and trying to build global world class you know, not wait for lightning to strike for the next REM or Nortel to be generated, but for us to get a bit of a factory going in terms of generating uh, world-class companies that can actually uh, uh, succeed on a global basis. We are also a destination from an innovation showcase point of view. We're very proud of the fact that every year we see over 150,000 visitors from every jurisdiction and every kingdom in the world, um, and we host about 2,000 plus events. Uh, I think there's some fairly major events uh, and festivals coming to Toronto that uh, we are uh, very, very hopeful that we will be uh, a productive partner in. Um, so Toronto, again, is having a moment, and we're very proud to be part of that moment. Our basic mission is to help innovators change the world. Uh, we all have seen, uh, I think, some of the um, uh, great advances under version 1.0 of the innovation economy coming from the Valley. We've also seen recently uh, some of the holes that have been exposed. Now, as an entrepreneur, I've always been very, very, uh, uh, I've had a huge preference to be a fast follower as opposed to being first in. And I think we have a chance here at Mars, at Toronto, to do things in a very different way than the first wave of innovation. We should not only be pursuing a financial return, but a significant social impact. And Mars, at its ethos, has that at its heart. Um, we have uh, major technology platforms uh, such as health, uh, clean tech, energy and environment, um, finance and commerce, work and learning. These are heavy science categories that really drive both impact as well as return. And I think this is what defines Mars. There's over 1,200 companies in each of these spaces and they're supported by major platform technologies. We've heard about artificial intelligence, blockchain, um, uh, robotics, uh, advanced manufacturing, data, analytics, these are all the topics that go on every single day at Mars, and I think they define, as I said, um, the future of where Toronto can basically choose to play, differentiate, and win. So let's talk about impact. We've talked about the $3.5 billion raised and the $1.8 billion in revenue. If we look at this hub, 
It is now working at scale, uh, and uh, we talked about the imputed market capitalization being the five to seven billion dollars. Um, this, is, this is worth repeating just because it is so significant. It is not pocket change. It is actually um, rare that we're at this point in time. The thing we have to do is not sit on our hands. Um, you know, the conversations around America First and Brexit, I think, give us a differentiated presence and personality in the global stage. And I can attribute this to, for the first time in my life, as an entrepreneur and as a business person, seeing talent flowing into Toronto as opposed to uh, fighting tooth and nail to keep our teams, our talent from being poached by San Francisco, Boston, New York City. It's flowing our way for the first time, but we can't sit on our hands. Um, this is a moment of unfair advantage, but it is just a moment. So if there's any imperative I wanted to share with the folks around this room, councillors, it is that we must convert unfair advantage into winning more than our fair share on a commercial basis globally. That means backing our winners, and that means doubling down on where we have scale. So, um, how about some of the leading indicators of success? You know, we often talk about diversity as being a nice thing to have and a good thing and a noble thing and a Canadian thing. Absolutely true. But I'm going to propose that it is not only all of those things, but it is absolute competitive advantage. If we are trying to compete in a talent-driven economy with one arm tied behind our backs because we do not address the issue of diversity, we, my friends, are going to fail. The second thing is, in our ecosystem, we are currently seeing, and this chart's a little bit busy, but it's interesting because it says that, by all accounts, Toronto is what, number nine? on the list of global companies according to start, uh, global countries in, in terms of the Startup Genomes Report in terms of diversity. Um, we have somewhere around a 19 percent uh, level uh, and, and the thing is that in Mars we're seeing a 28 percent. So we actually do zero in on diversity at Mars as a strategic advantage and as a competitive advantage for our ventures. Um, this we think drives part of how we actually address the talent gap. Um, both from a gender as well as an ethnicity as well as uh, age and, and so all of these things matter. The second thing that we find is that founders with previous startup experience have about a 10x effect on success of their next ventures. So we're very proud of the fact that the ventures in Mars are represented by somewhere around a 70 percent, you know, second or third venture type of a, a heat map. Um, not only do we have 100 scale-ups today, we have the rest of the 1,100 companies in Mars that are diverse, that have serial founders behind them, that represents a huge pipeline of potential future economic activity. So um, I think what I'd like to just leave you with is on the last chart, right after this one, um, that Mars, because of all this activity and because of Toronto having a global moment, we have global reach as well. And this is one of the things we have to leverage. We uh, uh, have an opportunity to not sit on our hands, to build on what we have, and to basically amplify our commercial successes on the world stage with our entrepreneurs. The, the hope is that we're able to build a platform around Mars and Toronto where we can achieve network effect and become a destination for entrepreneurs, for capital, for talent, and for market adoption. Our goal is to convert this platform, working at scale, into a fully connected innovation supply chain. Why? Because we, Mars and Toronto, have the opportunity to then become the premier launch pad for made in Canada narwhal companies to succeed in the world stage. I'd like to leave it at that. Maybe Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Yu. Um, we have questions of you, um, Councillor Holland. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, through you. Thanks again for coming. It was a great presentation and always uh, amazing work that you're starting to venture into. Uh, so thanks so much for actually coming on board with Mars and congratulations for that. Um, in terms of the, I know you mentioned diversity. Yes. And uh, we have Michelle, Michelle McMain leading out uh, with female founders out of Mars. So uh, I believe that it's, so it's 28% of the Mars Ventures have female founders. Right. And uh, what about in terms of, um, you were saying it was a competitive advantage. 
what are we what what are, what are we finding with that? Like, what are we finding with especially at Mars? I would say, yeah. uh, it's a very diverse and inclusive environment. And uh, how are you finding that to be the competitive advantage? Well, um, specifically at Mars. Um, so our direct experience at Mars is that seventy percent of Martians are actually female. And on my leadership team, I would say that comes closer to 40-something percent. Um, it's good, but it's not enough. I'm going to put that out there as well. And the reason I say that is because um, we have more to do to actually engage those with great talent through a development process so that we can increase the diversity that's in our team. And again, I'll come back to why that's competitive advantage is because um, we can't leave our most talented uh, on the sidelines when we're fighting uh, to basically win on the innovation economy. It's, the innovation economy is absolutely driven by diversity of thought. Uh, it's also driven by availability of talent. And if we think we're going to do this uh, by sort of the, uh, and, and listen, I've built and sold companies in the Valley, so I think I can maybe contrast this. We're not going to do this by going with a bro culture where there's only, you know, uh, less than 50% of our available talent being engaged at any one particular time. We have to do this by accessing a broader group that's available and, and tapping into the diversity of thought. We, we have a small country by population, um, yet we have the most diverse population in the world. And if we're not taking advantage of that, um, I think we can't win by numbers, so we got to win by sort of the, uh, the, the smarts by which we actually go about this. That's great. And um, in terms of the, uh, I just have two quick questions. One is about scale. Yeah. And you were mentioning um, we were having this conversation with the, a few, um, with the federal government in terms of backing uh, our winners and, go, and moving to scale. Uh, because we've always, well, I think historically, just because I mean, we started backing all the startups, which was great when we were sort of younger, I would say. Right. And now we're moving on to, um, we're sort of growing up in Toronto and growing, and now we're moving to scale. So what are you seeing? How are you seeing that landscape change and the, with, with funding from the, let's say, federal government, provincial government? Yeah. Um, uh I think there's there's two perspectives on that. Um, let me use an example at Mars. Uh, one of the most successful investments that has been made recently has been a decision to double down on the artificial intelligence platform that sits right at Mars and U of T. So the Vector Institute, which I think everybody here might, might have heard about or known about. Jeffrey Hinton um, may be a U of T professor and, you know, uh, a machine learning uh, engineer and scientist. He's also the godfather of artificial intelligence. Now, artificial intelligence was invented by Marvin Minsky in 1958, a long time ago. But we now have quantum computing, and we have huge data sets to drive real advances in artificial intelligence now. So by investing into something like artificial intelligence as a thesis, and building and investing a platform to do that with, What's happened is that the best always want to work with the best. And so Dr. Hinton has now attracted co-founders to the Vector Institute from across the globe who represent the best and the brightest in artificial intelligence around the world. And what's that done? There's been a cascade effect now into assembling some of the top commercial artificial intelligence labs in the world from Uber, through to Samsung, who are just moving their team in as of last week, uh, through to uh, RBC right here at home, but a global company nonetheless. Um, so we're starting to see that assembly of talent be a magnet for commercial uh, innovators to then be a magnet for the discoveries which then drive the economy. So that's the thesis. Now, if, what if we were to deal with uh, uh, data, uh, for instance, in the same kind of way, data lakes? We have a uh, huge advantage here in Toronto. Remember that although China can drive a billion points of data every single time they wish, um, it's all homogenous. Uh, here in Toronto, we actually have data that doesn't contain bias because we have such heterogen heterogeneity in the data we have access to. So um, we, we, we think there's several of these theses that might drive significant further investment and to continue to build on success. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Holland. Councillor Hart? 
Yes, thank you, Chair. I'd like to hear your comments on how we can take advantage of, of world politics right now. You touched on it slightly, yeah. in, in particular politics south of the border, how that can be an opportunity for us, and what specific advice would you give City Council? Um, well, maybe that last chart that we showed might be a bit of the clue. We do have a story to tell right now, and I would just basically double down on telling that story in a very significant fashion globally. Um, the uh, Global Skills uh, Talent Visa that uh, Canada has basically enacted has allowed us to offer very, very fast processing for um, new uh, newcomers to get into uh, the country. We should be all over that right now. Toronto itself represents a destination, not a source, for the first time in my career. And we should be telling that story on a global basis, which I think we're starting to do. Uh, some of the festivals that we referred to earlier on actually bring global attention to Toronto. And I think, you know, everything in its time and its place, but right now is our time and our place. Um, let's not be Let's, let's, let's not be too humble about what we are right now. In fact, I'd, I'd say um, let's not mistake Canadian humbleness for a lack of ambition or um, a lack of boldness. I think those things can coexist. And we need to tell that story, tell that story strongly. And um, it's like playing hockey. I think you kind of uh, let's, let's, let's do this like we play hockey, not like, uh, you know, we can always apologize after we win. But I think we have an opportunity to win right now. <laughs> well, it's only the first one. <laughs> Order. <laughs> All right, thank you. Further questions? Okay, um, I have a few, um, Mr. Wu. We, we have met, we have talked a little bit about um, our city's plan. The City of Toronto had, and Mars has an MOU with respect to how we will relate and, and, and how we'll work towards promoting the city. One of the things that has happened over the last little while, we've had um, stories in the media. Specifically, there was one some time ago by a so-called investigative reporter who did a real job, I would say, on Mars with respect to talking about the boondoggle and the waste of monies and so on. You're here to tell us today about the amazing benefits that the investment has actually been able to bring, not only to, to Mars, but to the city of Toronto and beyond. Yes. I wonder if you could speak to that, because we have a situation here where there's a bit of um, a gap or a separation, where there are those in the media who seem to think that Toronto is a sleepy little city and Toronto shouldn't be competing globally and Toronto shouldn't be outselling itself and so on. They represent this notion that either politicians are just on this notion of junket and so on and so forth. We have been places around the world with Mars promoting and doing the very things that you've talked about. I wonder if you could help us maybe just to talk a little bit about this need to be out front and to be where the puck's going to go as opposed to being in the scrimmage where the puck is and everybody's trying to find it, et cetera, where you can go clear a field in order to be able to score that goal. Absolutely. Um, one of my favorite topics, actually. Um, and I'll start by saying that something like Mars doesn't happen as if by magic. And uh, when you uh, work at something long enough, um, you have to work through challenges in order to get to the, uh, I think, the outcomes that we all want. Um, I'll tell you that first company that I built on my credit cards, you know, you, the bookends are it started with Amex, MasterCard, Visa, and the other bookend is that became Oracle Financial Services. Along the way, I had to basically survive the check bust. I had to survive 9-11. I had to survive the wipeout of the financial services sector. And we took from three credit cards, one person, and uh, uh, you know, um, uh, one customer to 400 people back down to less than 50 before we regrew it to 250, and it became Oracle. This is, my personal views, I think, reflect the experience of Mars as well. Mars had to fight through challenges. It wouldn't have got through challenges without strong partnerships. Mm. In fact, I can look around this room and identify specific backers at times when it wasn't easy to back Mars. But here's where we're at now. Um, we are the largest urban innovation hub in the world. That's not easy to get to. You have to get through challenges. But having gotten here, um, the worst thing we can do is sit on our hands. Um, because the world is moving quickly, the cycle of innovation is shortening, and we must basically capitalize on our advantages. Um, 
Is Toronto a, a sleepy um, place uh, that shouldn't really look towards the rest of the world for its ambitions? Um, I think the press that thinks that should really go and talk to non-Torontonians. Um, they should really go and talk to uh, the French, uh, the Germans, um, the Americans, and they should really take a look at where the talent is flowing. That is really your first leading indicator um, as to what people on the ground are thinking and doing and preferring. So Mars is part of the story. Mars in Toronto really is the story. We are an absolute destination. People are coming here because they want to be here, not because they are being shoehorned to come here. It's an amazing opportunity. We have um, heard your comment with respect to uh, capital. Yes. Um, one of the things that we often get asked is, how can the city assist in helping the businesses here with respect to their scale up second round of um, funding and so on because it appears that while there's a lot of money in the city, those monies tend to go elsewhere in order to fund projects and so on. Um, and I give the example of Nano Leaf who had to leave University of Toronto to go to Hong Kong just to raise it initially at a hundred thousand dollars. Uh, they, when they arrived in Hong Kong, they were told that's way too small in terms of the amount of money, so please ask for more, and they got yeah. more, and a lot of the production is now in China and elsewhere and so on. The founders have come back to Toronto running their business. But we get asked often, how can you, the city, help to encourage uh, VCs and, and others and angel investors and so on to help uh, small business? I was recently in New York when I had numerous meetings with a number of VCs, and one of the things they said to me was, um, Canada is known for the things that you've just pointed out, but it seems to lack that element in terms of encouraging those organizations to be here to take a risk and or the knowledge is lacking. Yeah. And so we're trying to create that window of information and providing a sense of understanding so that we can actually help to encourage more investors to come in. What are your thoughts with respect to why uh, Mork, for example, Canadian funds are not investing in uh, high technology and other types of initiatives here. What, what is the concern about the risk or what is it just the lacking of the things? For example, one of the, there's a, there's a, um, there's a thing in New York City, it's called Link NYC. Mm -hmm. It's a uh, platform there all around the city. There's about 1,500 of them made in Scarborough. Not one of those particular piece of technology is available in anywhere in Canada. Mm -hmm. It's in Singapore, Taiwan, and every place else. And yesterday, when I was in New York, I spoke to them about the fact that it was made in Scarborough. Everyone in New York was shocked, actually, that it's a Canadian-made technology. So I guess your thoughts on that, and I realize it's, it's, a, it's a big question, but I'd like to hear your thoughts as such. I think it's a great question, actually. Uh, my, my answer, again, is going to come from my personal experience. Yeah. Um, but it is that um, entrepreneurs, and talent and capital and you know strategic partners on a global base, they are basically borderless. They will go where they can get the biggest impact in the fastest possible time. I think Toronto literally does have a chance to step in and be that connected supply chain that supplies these particular ingredients that are necessary to grow great companies here. If we don't become a destination, back to that point, of that innovation supply chain, nano leafs are going to happen because they're going to have to follow the capital. Capital represents owners and shareholders who will then pull them into places where they can, you know, bicycle to their board meetings, not fly to their board meetings. So it's imperative that we address the innovation supply chain of capital uh, and of talent here and of bringing global adopters here. Now, I don't think it all has to be Canadian. I actually think that having global sources of that innovation supply chain raise the game, and we need to raise the game for our ventures. Remember that one in 1,500 ever makes it to a global stage, which means that 1,499 do not. And therefore, I think Darwin's laws of natural selection work just fine in the entrepreneurial sector. We have an opportunity to reduce the failure rate and increase the success rate if we address a connected innovation supply chain. And we do, Councillor Thompson, have global sources of capital right here. Um, we have pension funds sitting in our city that are seeking 
not just a financial return, but their portfolio investments have some of the largest exposures to climate change, and their pension uh, populations have some of the largest exposures to an aging population living twice as long. So we should mobilize that capital and continue to make the case that, look, if we have deal flow, quality and quantity of deal flow at scale at places like Mars, there's no better place to come to invest. There's no better place to come and work. There's no better place to come and partner than right here in Mars and right here in Toronto. I think that's where the city can help us make that message clear. Excellent. Thank you very much. All right. Any further questions? Seeing none, speak. You have speakers, uh, Councillor Holland. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, through you. So thanks so much for coming and uh, great, phenomenal work really at Mars and your leadership. We really, really appreciate it. And thank you for coming to present here today. Uh, I, you know, in the last few years have really done a deep dive into the ecosystem and uh, it's just absolutely astounding to me the, uh, the level at which we're punching above our weight in Toronto and the massive transformation, I would say, I would say growth uh, come, that Toronto is growing up, um, that we, we, you know, we've been progressing at a certain level, but now we're sort of skyrocketing. And uh, I constantly hear that in the ecosystem and uh, the effect of the political environment in the US has had a great impact and that we have been able to attract and retail and exactly as you were saying, Young, about um, that a great stat, I mean, I always use that stat about the fact that we're outpacing uh, both New York and San Francisco combined with our job growth, 22,500 jobs, just phenomenal in one year. So uh, we are heads and tails just, just skyrocketing in North America. Um, but where we haven't done as great of a job is telling our story. Now, Mars has done a significant... Uh, like a phenomenal job in the past year. Really, the, the branding and the marketing and the social that's coming out of Mars has been exceptional. And we've been looking at that. Obviously, we're working together with you and with our team here, economic development, on building that narrative. Uh, because the problem is that when, when we go to tell our story or our stump speech or our elevator pitch, it's, uh, it's inconsistent. And so it's telling those stories and, uh, and conveying that message on the global stage. So whether it's myself or the mayor or Councillor Thompson or somebody's traveling abroad, and we need to be able to tell Toronto's story in a very uh, consistent way and that we're all singing from the same hymn tune. Right. So I'm really looking forward to see what ECDEV produces in terms of the narrative and uh, with Chris Ricketts in there and the team in there and how we can come out with that uh, as a consistent message. Um, but I just really want to thank Mars for the phenomenal work. I remember way back in the day, <laughs> I really aged myself here. Uh, I remember in 2003, I was working at Queen's Park, and we had just taken office, the Liberals, with Dalton McGinty. And uh, we were, uh, I would say, starting Mars or building it up and what it was in the Discover Discovery District and working with the universities and the, uh, and the ma major phenomenal uh, uh, hospital and, and the medical institutions and, and just the, the entire environment was really brewing. But as you said, that you had these unfortunate incidences. You had the blackout, we had uh, the SARS, we had the 2008 recession. So major things impacted Mars' ability to grow into what it is today. Uh, but we're seeing that today. And um, anytime I get asked, you know, by Beta Kid or any, any anybody, any, anyone globally even, where, do you, where would you go if you were gonna take somebody in Toronto? And I always say Mars. <laughs> I mean, where else would you take somebody? That's great. Um, but uh, there's other, there's major, you know, amazing, uh, from CDL to DMZ or 111, there's lots of other places, but I love the fact that Mars is doing so well that it's, it's going to expand. We, you, you've run out of space, there's so much interest. Uh, you, you cannot, uh, how is everybody? So we're, uh, we're blessed with the fact that, um, that we hope that, that you'll continue to do that. And uh, I really hope that we continue to work together and anything that we can do or we can convey uh, to the rest of council, uh, I think that you have you know, major support here on with economic development and the city, the, the team as well in economic development as well. So thanks a lot. Well, we're Thank very, you very, very much. grateful for your partnership. Thank you very much, Councilor Holm. Anyone else to speak? Um, okay, so I, I'll just wrap it up. Um, certainly, um, 
Mr. Yu, uh, I'd like you to ask um, and to ask you to, on behalf of this committee to thank your wife <laughs> for <laughs> basically encouraging you to come <laughs> back out of retirement and so on, because I think that uh, on the meetings and the discussions we've had and uh, the presentation you've made here today, um, I think that Mark, Mars is actually in great hands. Um, I think Elise did an amazing job and um, Elsa did an amazing job and we we're wondering who would be the next leader and we have found that leader. Um, it is, um, for me, a, a proud opportunity that this uh, group at EDC had chosen to work with Mars and has, had recognized the objectives and the direction that Mars was going in to, uh, when there were many doubters in this city and so on, whether or not it's in the media and elsewhere. There was a time when people were saying, we're spending all of this money on this organization. They have facilities that they can't utilize. And now what we're hearing is that, in fact, you are tapped. You don't have enough room for those who want to be here and you're looking globally with respect to bringing uh, technology and uh, supplement that with, with, the, with the local talent that's here. Uh, I'm, I'm uh, particularly um, you know, happy with the fact that you are um, obviously preaching to us who are the converted already, but you are talking about the fact that there's a real need, and the mayor has been very clear about this as well, a need for us to sell ourselves and talk about our stories, the things that we are doing. We're not doing enough of that. It is apparent to me, though, that based on your presentation, the discussions we've had and the um, conversation we've had with our staff team led by Mike Williams and Council Holland and others and all the members here, that we are cognizant as to what the needs and what the opportunities are, and we are going to move in the direction that really helps us to focus to address a number of fundamental questions. Those questions for me fundamentally are, when I'm in my community and I have a grandmother or a grandfather say to me, uh, Councillor Thompson, what will my grandchildren be doing? Will they have an opportunity here? Will they be able to buy a house here? Will they be able to have a job here and so on? And I'm saying to them, yes, they will, because we are going to work with to train them to help them. So we have whether or not it's manufacturing round tables and other discipline, they're looking at ensuring that young people are going to be trained working in collaboration with our institutions and so on, because that's another fundamental part of it. It's not just the capital issue. It is not just the fact that we need to sell ourselves and so on, but we need to ensure that we develop an ecosystem that is innovative, that is inspirational, that helps to develop the talent and focusing on diversity whether or not we're talking about specific groups in this city that we're trying to get more women in techs, more blacks in techs, and others and so on, because it really speaks to the point that you make about the diversity. It's one thing to talk about being a diverse society. It's another thing to actually implement and put in place the structure where all of us can actually bring our talent to the table and whether or not it's simply through thought and or actions and so on, and bringing that and developing that in a, in a robust way that helps us. We are, in fact, a destination. I see that globally. I travel a lot to promote this city to ensure that we have a place where we're competing globally. We can sit behind our desk all we want and we can mope about um, the fact that we're not able to achieve as our potential. We will never achieve our potential by just sit sitting in a closed room or close the walls of this particular city. It's unfortunate that many don't understand that, but at the end of the day, I will say this uh, publicly now, I don't worry about those who don't under understand it because it is our job to ensure that they understand by going out and demonstrating what the opportunities are and so on. We have long actually positioned Toronto as a place for people to come and land and touch down. When we travel globally, this is the part of the presentation that we, we present. We are able to demonstrate to um, business leaders, to decision makers, to government leaders and so on globally that this is a place where collaboration takes place and so on. We've signed, uh, when I started we had I think uh, about nine relationships with cities around the world. I think we're, and if George can maybe shake his head, we're over 30 or we're actually close to 40 right now, 28, and, and, and there's a number of others that are waiting to, to be in place and so on. This helps us because it creates a platform for our business. And we've also added another element. We've signed on with the World Trade Center organization to help us to help to train our local businesses to not only imagine, but also to be able to implement and put in place measures to compete globally. 
because that is where we can make those opportunity of exporting jobs and technology and so on to enrich and ensure that our city will prosper long into the future, long after all of us here are gone into other things and other places and so on. So the new crop of people that are coming in are able to enhance and develop because we've laid a, a foundation, we've laid a rich structure that they can build upon. So I'm looking forward to our continued relationship. And again, I want you to thank your wife for me because I'm so happy that you are leading the organization and thank you. I'm happy with the relationship we're having with Mars and so on. So with that, I'll move receipt of your presentation. Again, thank you and I look forward to continuing working with us. We haven't even touched on uh, sidewalk labs and all the other things that are actually going to take place in the city. There's so much going on. We have the talent, we have the ability. We just have to make things happen, so thank you. Uh, members, all those in favor of receiving the presentation? Opposed, it's carried, thank you. All right, thank you. Moving right along. Okay, okay, thank you. All right, moving right along. We are now moving to, um, ED 28.2, uh, Toronto's on-screen industry 28, 2017 year in review. And uh, our film commissioner, Mr. Zabe Sheikh, is here with his team. And Mr. Z uh, Sheikh, your full title is film commissioner and director of entertainment industries. Welcome. Uh, thank you, Chair and uh, Committee. Uh, you know me well. Uh, I've got our team here of uh, Magali Simard and Harold Ma, who represent our film team through the Permit and Sector Development. We have our Chair of the F Film, Television, and Digital Media Board as visiting counselor. We have folks who are here from our uh, board uh, represented in the audience. Uh, we have our general manager, so we've got a lot of wiser heads than uh, my, mine that uh, are here to probably answer questions or make statements or give their uh, wizardry and wisdom on the next three topics, but I'll take you through with our team uh, through this presentation of 2017, the year in review, as it relates to the production investment numbers. The reason I try to break that out is to say that Overall, Toronto is still a powerhouse in this country, in North America, as we just heard, not only on the tech scale, but on the film, media, and entertainment, in the fact that Toronto is this location, the city, the venue for most of the head offices, all the broadcasting that happens, and all the sort of news, sports, entertainment, media, money, and employment, and jobs, but we don't factor that into this presentation, or this kind of presentation. This is really specifically a around the production investment that comes domestically or through foreign uh, investment in production only. So we'll take you through that. But before I get to those numbers, I just want to say that that larger piece of the pie <clears throat> uh, represents uh, roughly uh, between three to four billion dollars annually that gets run in the economy of Toronto. Um, for the production investment, we had another great year. It was a stellar year, the second highest ever on record. Uh, the total is $1.8 billion, as you can see from that beautiful pie chart. Um, it was a stellar year not only because of the $1.8 billion in production investment, but also Toronto made productions, Toronto productions that had Toronto talent that were shown globally and in the U.S. actually accounted for a lot of the award-winning productions, whether it was streaming services, whether it was television, or whether it was uh, film. We got a lot of awards, whether it was Canadian Screen Awards, whether it was the Emmys, whether it was the Golden Globes, or in fact the Best Picture Oscar, which uh, Toronto producer with Guillermo del Toro, who is an adopted Torontonian, uh, picked up this year. So that was great news. Um, some of the fluctuation that you see on this, you'll see the pie chart underneath says 2 billion and 1.8. You'll be wondering, what is that a dip? Yes, it is. That dip is uh, related to, and we've got our um, uh, board member, Cynthia uh, Lynch from uh, Film Ontario, and Film Ontario recently re released a report that talked about the fact that there is such high demand for studio infrastructure in our city that in fact we did leave some business on the table. We did, our studios did have to turn away some uh, and on a conservative uh, researched data that looked at about $130 million. So that kind of represents that little gap that you're going to see. It represents that high demand. Um, the other thing that it represents is that 
Tor Toronto is very much a television sh short form, if you will, rather than, uh, or a small screen environment. And when you make a television series, it's not about coming in for a few months and, and then leaving as big features do. It's about sustaining growth, five, six, seven seasons. And so the economy and how that business works kind of goes a little steadier. You don't see the peaks and valleys as much, but uh, you'll see a steady climb or a s sort of consistent through line, which again represents a little bit of the dip, but overall we'd say at our team here, and you can ask us questions later and Magali and Harold will be able to take you through it, that that is a very strong element to our economy, that we have television series which require space, but they require space for a lot more time. So in fact, they don't allow other productions to come in when they have taken space, and we have some really big television sh series shooting here. So if we move uh, to the next one, the total production investment yearly from major productions which comprise of television series, feature films, web content, music videos, and other special projects, but don't in, uh, oh, that's later. This one just represents a little graph chart, so you can see that 2010 to 2013, we had a $1.1 billion average, which was very nice, but in the last four years, you'll see it's really taken some leaps and bounds. And uh, the big factor here that we look at on the side is that over 30,000 people are employed at the City of Toronto in these jobs, in this infrastructure, and we'd like to see it grow, and it will. So uh, the all major productions investment by type, we just want to break that out for you, what that means. That means television series, feature films, web content, music videos, special projects. Uh, it doesn't include commercials, VFX, and animation, which make up that other uh, sort of $400 uh, million. Uh, recap of the awards that you can see on the, uh, on the side that the, our, our Toronto productions picked up. We already mentioned that. Moving on. That's again a gra graph representation, just so you can see kind of the, the, the bill. That's, it's pretty steady, um, but uh, you'll see again the last four years have been uh, increased and exponentially higher. Let's go to the pie charts. So, this one uh, it gives a, the fluctuation, it's a little more apparent here. And again, I just wanna say, uh, this is where we talk about how the television series <laughs> environment is what adds to that, as well as, of course, uh, the studio infrastructure that we talked about earlier. <coughs> Moving right along. So now we look at domestic productions, of course, which uh, account for almost half um, of our uh, investment, production investment. And that's a really good news story. It means that the foreign production and that expertise and that skill and that money and that history that comes to Canada allows for Toronto and sort of domestic talent in front of and behind the scenes to really grow, to really level up, and the economy grows and levels up. You want to see a, a jurisdiction, at least in Canada, I'd say, that has a strong domestic growth as well as foreign. There are other jurisdictions in this country who do very well, and they're in the top five as well of jurisdictions in North America, folks uh, such as in Vancouver and Montreal, but you will see those probably that they have a higher level of foreign investment than domestic, considerably higher, and that of course leaves us to uh, the, the mercy of what the foreign domestic looks like, uh, foreign investment looks like. So when you have a good domestic st strength uh, in terms of your production, it means the, uh, the grant systems are working, the funding systems are working, and more importantly, the talent is being showcased and hired domestically. So that's a, a really good news story. Uh, this just breaks out in graph form what it looks like uh, from the feature films, television, animation, VFX, and commercials on a, on a yearly uh, basis. Um, there's a lot that happens in Toronto. We're one of the few jurisdictions uh, in North America that allow for whether you're a student filmmaker or whether you're a multi-billion dollar filmmaker and animator, uh, you will have access to our streets, to our studios, um, as equitably as possible. And that's a big deal in, in this jurisdiction. Uh, and this uh, really relates to uh, the final, uh, almost final graph, is really about the location filming and the permits. I want to give a shout out, obviously, to our permit team who can't be at this presentation because they're busy on the first floor working really hard, processing uh, over 3,000 permits a year, um, which is a really big deal. Uh, it's a small but mighty team. Uh, as you'll see, the city had over 6,804 days of production in a 365-day year. So. Uh, 
uh, I'm not very good at math and get a lot of good marks, but I know that that's a, <laughs> that's a exponentially higher number to the amount of days in the year. So we're very proud of our team uh, because we have a city commitment to turn around permit requests within 48 hours and to be able to get the industry 6,804 days of production on the city streets is a very big deal and I want to commend uh, everyone here. And that's really a, a kind of an overview. That's a little shot of uh, the shape of water. One of our earlier slides, you would have seen the XOTO brand. This is not the time and place to talk about that really, but that uh, re uh, is uh, our brand that represents what we are doing with the community and how we are branding what uh, television film series are, are taking on. It'll remind you of some of those kind of made in New York things you might have seen. Well, XOTO is a recently released program um, that you can see at the end of films that were shot here. Um, you can see in your your neighborhoods in the give back programs and you can see on the bus shelters and, and uh, billboards um, so it's a very cool uh, thing that we're doing here in Toronto and a new one in the last few years that's it for the presentation I know there's three items on this so we'll take questions as you wish um, yes thank you uh, Commissioner what I'd like to do uh, now we do have um, a speaker on this particular item I'd like to ask the speaker to come forward and then we'll bring you all back uh, to allow members to ask questions okay Members, so we have um, Miss um, uh, Cynthia Lynch, who's here to speak on this item. Ms. Lynch, would you please come forward? You'll have five minutes to speak. So let me know when you're ready, Miss Lynch. You're all set. Good morning. Welcome. You have five minutes to speak. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and I'll be brief. And I think these remarks apply equally to the next item on the agenda as well as what Zabe just spoke to. Um, so I am Managing Director and Counsel of Film Ontario. Film Ontario is an industry consortium representing approximately 35,000 people who work in the screen-based industries in the province, the large majority of which work and live right here in Toronto. I'm also a member of the Film, Television and Digital Media Board. And I just wanted to take a couple minutes today to say thank you to all of the economic development staff for their hard work throughout the year, um, and especially the members of the film office, Zabe and his team, and uh, Megley and Harold, who have come on board re relatively recently and really jumped in with both feet. Uh, as Zabe noted, we've had a great year in the city with both the Best Picture Oscar winning uh, Shape of Water and the most it's outstanding drama series at the Emmys, Handmaid's Tale filmed in Toronto, which is wonderful recognition for the hard work of the thousands of people who work on those productions and many others. The city staff have implemented a fantastic marketing campaign in the XOTO campaign and they've backed it up with excellent customer service on the permit side and by continuing to make improvements in the permitting. Uh, they've also been very proactive on the studio file, which I guess is another item, <laughs> agenda item today, and worked hard to find creative ways for the industry to grow here in the city, um, which Zabe alluded to, there is a huge need for that, and we look forward to uh, the presentation today and continuing to work on that file. And lastly, they have organized a great day of business meetings and events for the delegation that the mayor is leading to Los Angeles next week. This will be an incredibly important opportunity to thank our clients in LA, to meet with some of the major new players so that we can continue to grow the industry and create the jobs. So we just, I wanted to say thank you again to ex dev staff and to the city as a whole for all their support for the industry. Okay, thank you very much. Are there any questions for Ms. Lynch? Okay, seeing none. Did you wish to speak on three as well, item three? I can call the you The comments apply to both. <laughs> okay, that's what I thought you said, but I just wanted to confirm that. Okay, thank you. thank you very much. Okay, thank you. I will have Mr. Sheikh and the team come back up because we have members with questions. Thank you. And I'll start with visiting um, councillors first. Councillor Fletcher, do you have questions on this particular item? No, I don't. Okay. I don't Fair have enough. questions, but I'm good. No problem. We'll bring it in uh, to committee then. Uh, I know that uh, Councillor Frakadakis has a question. Uh, Councillor, when you're ready. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, Welcome. So thanks for your presentation, Zabe. I'm just uh, wondering, as I look at um, three of the slides in the slide deck that you provided to us, uh, pages four, pages, <clears throat> excuse me, six and page seven in particular, and I was wondering, I noticed an upward trajectory up to 2016 and then 2017 dips, and I was wondering um, what explains for that dip in the um, in the yearly uh, investment, um, 
just wondering, should we be alarmed? Uh, I don't think we should be alarmed, and I'll pass it over to Magali, who can give you a little greater breakdown of, of what that dip uh, represents. Thank you. Um, no, we should not be alarmed, as Abe said. Uh, the, the, the biggest reason, there's always many factors in something like this. We like to look at it in tr three years uh, portions and see the trend this way more than year by year. One tenpole movie can dip suddenly $150 million on your totals by the end of the year. The number one answer to this uh, is the studio space and the structure of occupancy. So. Uh, having the types of massive, uh, typically American series that come, and as they pointed uh, quickly earlier, can park for literally three years. If they put a block on three seasons, that's suddenly a studio space that cannot be utilized by anyone else, not even in the middle sometimes when they pause between the seasons. Um, the, the two following reports uh, are directly addressing that, uh, the issue around studio space and the steps that the city is taking with its uh, industry partners to um, to not only um, calculate the amount of space that might be needed, but the next uh, few steps uh, to grow the studio space. There's been announcements uh, lately around that uh, that I think we'll be speaking to uh, during the reports, and uh, next steps in the next year and a half to address the growth. If we grow, they will come is uh, the basis that we're operating on, and that's uh, the basis that's been proven right in the past two years. And that studio space that we currently don't have that we've had to turn people away from, um, when will that be up and operational? I think that we'll be speaking about that at the next away. reports, especially on the studio space relocation and growth report. Uh, I'm not sure. Oh, is that item four? Mike, if yeah. you. I think we're. Uh, I thought we were dealing sure, with two I think we're dealing with together. all three items, are we? Uh, yeah, no, we are actually oh. dealing with all the items. Yeah. Okay, so, sure. Yeah. 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 So I, I can address uh, the question, uh, Councilor Frakadagas. Uh, this the Showline Studio, which Council and the leadership of Councillor Fletcher uh, supported the repurchasing and re uh, 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 putting it back in the market. That'll happen this summer. So by by sometime this summer, they'll, it'll be available for uh, for production. So that's the most immediate one. Uh, Cinespace made uh, an announcement recently, and that will be coming on. I would suspect. Uh, within the next little while. Um, uh, Pinewood have made a number of announcements, both in the and they're building right now, and there's more to come there. Plus, we are making some uh, additional land available uh, in the Portlands for, for studios this year. Okay, uh, so so we may see a bit of a dip in 2018 until this space is, uh, like, looking forward to this ch chart in next year when this presentation comes back to the next Economic Development Committee, there might be a dip in 2018. It may not match the 2016 number, correct? It should match the 2017 number. Right, okay. And then perhaps 2019 will match 2016. Or better. Or better. Or right. leverage higher, yeah, absolutely. And right now we'll we are seeing... we have some ground in order to like surpass it, so it could be 2020 where we go back to 2016. Uh, well, the way the economy is working and w with the technological shifts that happen quickly in this space, you can sometimes see really greater growth. Um, it's what, if you can see the chart uh, below, uh, between 2010 and what happened in 2016, there was some really big gains. That's kind of the trajectory that we can start seeing again uh, between 2018 and 2020. And we're tracking actually uh, at the same or slightly above right now in terms of productions coming in as of this time last year and this time right now. So it's good news. Great. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Council Recordax. Councillor Grubbs. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Zabe, on page nine there, um, that chart animation seems to be kind of tripling there, I guess, after 15, almost tripled in 16. So we see a big rise in the animation. What more can we do to support the animation? It seems corner gas is going animated now. What can we do to be supporting this animation? I mean, we don't need studio space, right? But what more can we be doing to see that grow even further? Absolutely. I'll uh, again pass it over to Magali. She's been working closely with our uh, Computer Animation Studios of Ontario members, uh, and, and some of our uh, key people in that are on our board, and so she has, I think, a, a really good answer for that. Yeah, as you point out, uh, Councillor Graham, is, uh, the, uh, the space is less of an issue for uh, post-production and animation. Uh, it is. It remains one of the least data-driven part of our industry, and we're uh, 
we're through our board uh, been assessed that this is one place where, where we do need data to see where the gaps are, uh, how much we can absorb more, uh, and where the employment gaps might be in the training that should follow suit. It's a very, very healthy industry. Toronto has now attracted, uh, continues to attract more and more, even post-production only. So a lot of the major titles that we see photos of the film shot in Toronto, um, that's one part, but there's also the parts of films that are shot elsewhere and then posted here for both VFX and animation. Uh, now, in terms of gathering that data to see exactly where we'll be able to meaningfully uh, assist that part of the industry, uh, CASO, the association that uh, Zabe just uh, pointed out to, Computer Animation of Ontario, um, are spearheading uh, an industry business intelligence gathering document uh, with Nordicity, and the city is partaking in funding uh, that with the province. Uh, the results will be coming out uh, this summer uh, with a launch of that information in the fall, which we'll be partaking in, and this will guide the next steps as to what, where the CG should intervene or assist. It's one of the pillars of the STRAT plan, of the Spotlight Strategic Plan, which we're updating, which we're speaking about, I guess, right now as well. Um, uh, and one of them is the digital support, uh, the digital media support, sorry, from the city, and uh, as we worked with the board on determining what the next steps should be for this part of the industry. Number one was data gathering, which is the first step we're taking. Right. And on, on studio space, how much studio space do we need? I'm, I'm finished, I hear everything's going, a lot of stuff's going to Hamilton now because we don't have the studio space, we're turning people away. How much studio space do we need? Do we have any idea uh, like right now in the current conditions? Sorry, we're get, well, we're working with economic development uh, and our industry uh, partners, sorry, on gathering the total number of square footage of stages and support space for production right now. Uh, as you know, the Portlands is uh, of major concern and, and excitement at the same time for all of us. Um, no, we have not determined exactly how much uh, we should grow. Um, the current numbers that we're uh, working with for the sites that um, RGM just talked about uh, represent a growth from their relocation. So just the announcements of recent between Pinewood and Cinespace of the stuff that is confirmed to happen and the sites exist and they're going to be uh, worked on represent an end gain from the relocation that we're working with. Um, I don't want to throw a number of exactly how much uh, growth we can take in terms or should support in terms of studio space, uh, but everything points to quite a lot. Right. Well, I can I can add just a little bit more color. There's a film board meeting next week, I think, and uh, uh, this is a, a topic that I would like to raise with, at the film board to try to figure that out. Okay. Thank you very much, Councillor Grimes. Uh, anyone else for questions? Uh, Councillor Hart. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Just a couple of quick questions. I, I noticed on uh, page four of your presentation that the total production investment from 2010-2013 average to 2016 basically doubled. And you mentioned there's 30,000 jobs currently. Would that relate back to 2010-2013? Did the number of jobs almost double? Or what can you tell me about the jobs back in 2010-2013? I think, uh, through the Chair, thanks, Councillor. Uh, I think if you'll look at the past data sets, and I know Cynthia's here too in Film Ontario, and our partners at OMDC really do a lot of that uh, data driving, but uh, you'll have seen uh, not necessarily a doubling, but w the numbers looked more around 20,000, 25, and so we have seen a, a major increase. And right now we're working with our union partners at IATSE and NABET and our TDSB schools to really get training programs uh, going for students to jump in. And we're working with TESS as well. We had our first uh, film sector development this past year, um, de development workshop and, and skill sessions so that people can start really embracing this industry because as we grow the studio space and as the business gets uh, larger that we anticipate, we're going to need more people in it. Just one other brief question. You mentioned that we're very strong in small screen. Why is that, that we're so strong? I'll pass it over to Magali. She's been working closely again with the industry and uh, we can tag team on that answer or she can give you a really good one, I'm sure. Uh, we're now set with the infrastructure and the crew and the technicians for this. Uh, 
it's a bit of a snowball effect. Once we started being big and the numbers started to rise, it's now 75% small screen. And when we say small screen at this point, I think screen sizes can be confusing at this point with all of the ones we use. Uh, but by that, we really, uh, the, the big portion of that pie really is a scripted television series. So think the Netflix, the streaming services type series that take literally 75% of the production we're talking about. And once that starts, it means that you become the jurisdiction, if you do it well, that has the crews and the deep crews to do it and to have to be able to be a jurisdiction that can sustain a massive series like that and several other series at the same time and perhaps two feature films uh, is the main concern of everyone and that's what we became uh, very good at. I might just add that uh, Canadians are known as great storytellers as well, and so the arc of a story in television and or streaming, you know, uh, is it takes longer, needs more depth, um, and uh, traditionally uh, all our content has really been t television driven because we're great storytellers, whether we're animation and family storytelling, which is where we really excelled at in the 80s and 90s, and now where we're seeing that we're on screen services. I think that's what, uh, you know, the US market is really good at splash and then leave. We love to do a good sustained thing. And I just wanna say one more thing that I think um connects uh, two comments that were, or questions that were raised today is how much space can we uh, have and what, what made us good in a certain area. The desire from the industry, the answer to this in terms of the growth will be for us to be able to have say two tenpole movies at the same time, so 200 plus million dollar movies at the same time while one or two other series are shot. And this is the amount of crews that we will have to grow to grow, like that 30,000 will grow obviously with the space that will be grown and that's the desire from the industry. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Councillor Hart. Any further questions? Seeing none, uh, to speak. Visiting Councillor first and the Chair of the Film Board, Councillor Fletcher. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you very much to our staff for all this great work and these reports. Um, I'll just kind of touch on a number of them. I think it's a good idea we're doing them all together because they all do fit together. And the spotlight, our last year we did complete our strategic plan was published with the four pillars of infrastructure, of customer service, of branding and international relations, and finally digital. And I think that very important to hear that the scan of the industry, being able to determine what's going on in the digital field it will be the key to our future success because nobody knows it. And that's what the industry's asked us to participate in so we can move forward with that. The, um, I just want to, comment on the incredible divisional support for the film industry and also for our board and that's from the GM down. Thank you Mike to our film commissioner, film office, two new people in the film office, Magalie and Harold, happy you're there, welcome. And the mayor's office and the mayor's staff so critical to our film mission and also recognizing the work my staff does on this. It was a very challenging year in 2017 and part of the drop when Showline got sold uh, not for a not film use and the city had to step in. Um, we're thinking about it in one level, but the industry all of a sudden here is we've got a major studio, particularly a television studio that's out of commission. So I just have to really say the city stepped up in a big way to make sure that that isn't now starting a decline in the industry and we're very close to bringing that back on with an RFP and that as well through this process have looked at other spaces on the Portlands through the Portlands planning framework that would also be out with an RFP. So out of adversity, we've created something pretty good. Pinewood Studios itself was up for sale this whole period. So that's a little, uh, I, I would say nerve wracking. Nobody's quite sure what's going to happen. We do own a small percentage, but we don't own the controlling percent, that the river, we got all that money last year, 1.2 billion for the river, including our own dollars into that, but it meant that we've lo we're losing three major studio spaces because the river will be, you know the movie, A River Runs Through It? Well, that's our story here. So uh, moving quickly to, uh, pardon? Is Brad Pitt going to be in it? I don't know. We haven't decided to do this story yet. We're in the middle of this story. We're writing the script for moving uh, the studio capacity, working with Waterfront Toronto to move that studio capacity to other places and with um, the uh, 
RFPs. So uh, it and then it, it's just been a very challenging year in that way, and everybody has certainly stepped up. So that's great. The, a couple of things that I think are really good that the film board and our members have done is they've been very involved. And we look at the location shooting; it's really critical. And we know our big location is actually downtown Toronto, is the biggest location of all locations. And the uh, staff, city staff, and film board. Uh, staff and as well members of the film board have been very involved in Teal Core to make sure that we don't forget that that is our major studio. It's a big studio down there. And the King Street pilot to make sure that that's a very popular street for filming that we don't lose out with that. And that's worked out pretty well. And I think bringing into people's minds what an important industry this is, 30,000 jobs and working with tests to bring more people in and a training plan that's not small potatoes in the city of Toronto. It's a growing industry of the three, food, finance, and film. It is continually on an up growth. Despite the fact that the Ontario government has a, an incentive uh, for filming outside of the city, which I don't think we mentioned, but we're fighting that. So even fighting that, our numbers are still very, very good. Also had uh, our mission to LA, which the mayor goes on. It's really important that he does that because it's such a major message that Toronto is a film place. Besides TIFF, we are well known for film. We have a credible brand. And the fact that our chair of economic development goes as well, it's seen as an important recognition of how we view this industry in the city with tremendous amount of uh, support staff-wise and from elected officials. We have one uh, exciting kind of project that we're working on to increase locations this year, and it's in schools where we're, sorry, I'll finish on that, uh, hopefully announcing that over the next month of uh, location filming in designated prior, prior selected schools across the city, and as well a part of that would be uh, student learning opportunities in film, which is part of our training stream to get people into the industry. So just thank you to everybody. For great work. Thank you very much, Council Fletcher, and thank you as well for your outstanding work. Uh, anyone else, uh, members of committee, to speak? Okay, seeing none, I would like to then move uh, receipt of uh, this item, the presentation. Uh, all those in favor, oppose that's carried. Okay, and moving to uh, ED 28.3, update and implementation of uh, Spotlight on Toronto's on Toronto and Strategic Action Plan for the film, television, digital media uh, industry. I'd like to move to adopt the uh, the recommendations that are in the report. All those in favor, oppose, that's carried. Moving along to ED 28.4, the film studio capacity replacement and future growth. I'd like to move to adopt the recommendations that are in the report. All those in favor, oppose, that's carried. Thank you, members. We're moving along now to ED 28.5. Uh, uh, Councilor Frackett, sorry, I was just wondering the new business that we introduced. Um, could any of those be moved just to move this agenda along in the interest of time? Um, they could be, but I think we have a speaker on one of them, Councillor. Um, uh, so, pardon me. Well, there was two, so I'll move one of them. If you yeah, yeah, no, no, I, no, Councillor. Was, yeah, I was going to get to the point. The Councillor Fletcher's item. Um, we can actually deal with that. Yes, we can actually move that. So, Councillor, would you like to simply move that? Yes. Do you I want to speak like on it as well? Also no, I, it. it's a great letter. Let's support it. It speaks for itself. <laughs> All right. All those in favor of uh, ED 28.10. And of course, we vary the procedures to exempt this and then put this forward. All those in favor, opposed, that's carried. Thank you. That matter has been dealt with. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Frakadakis, for your suggestion. Um, moving right along, members, uh, ED 28.5, the um, nighttime economy, stakeholders, consultation, results, and uh, next step. I have the first speaker. Um, pardon, is uh, John O'Regan. Mr. O'Regan, are you here? John? Is that you, sir? Okay, great. Come on forward, please. You, I guess, have been watching the proceedings so far. You have five minutes to speak, and uh, members may ask you questions, sir. So let me know when you're ready, and I will start your time. I'm ready. Fantastic. Thank you, sir. Welcome. Good morning. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me, uh, to the chair and the committee members. Um, as the chair said, my name is John O'Regan. I'm uh, an art director um, and a uh, union member of the Directors Guild of Canada. 
working primarily, uh, I guess, according to those pie charts we just saw, uh, among the 25% of film industry professionals primarily focused on feature filmmaking. And uh, prior to that career, um, I was recording music and uh, touring the world performing uh, under the moniker Diamond Rings. Um, actually, one year was uh, privileged enough to uh, play right outside this building uh, as part of the Cavalcade of Lights. Um, and uh, outside of work, uh, I guess I'm, uh, I would describe myself as something of a night owl, uh, an electronic music enthusiast. And uh, I'd say uh, uh, just a, a person who, uh, you know, is, um, has something of a vested interest in, in uh, what uh, Elena Bird's report that we're looking at here today uh, dives into. Uh, I was lucky enough to be uh, one of the many stakeholders who was interviewed uh, during uh, what I uh, gather to be were many consultations in the uh, creation of this report. And uh, I want to congratulate Elena, first of all, for putting together what I think is a really well-written and well-researched body of work, uh, a really vital piece of work that um, hopefully everyone's taken a bit of time to look at uh, already, and uh, if not, might do so later after this meeting. Um, already, too, I've, I've noticed it's garnered a lot of positive media attention, which I think is warranted. Um, we can probably all agree on that, but uh, I'd like to imagine we could also agree that we're only just kind of at the beginning of this process and um, there could be a lot more attention paid to this issue, which uh, I think is really vital as it, um, I think, has the potential to synthesize or bring together people not just sort of in the music communities but also in, in the broader entertainment culture here in this city. Uh, when people come in to shoot a film, uh, it's, it's long hours, it's high stress, uh, there's, uh, let's say, something of a need to release some tension and blow off some steam on Fridays or Saturdays or whatever days the production has, you know, in between their work schedules. And um, I think that, like, this is the beginning of starting what could be a really consistent dialogue between uh, you, the city staff, people like myself who are stakeholders, and the general public at large. Um, that said, I, I suppose I am here to offer some mild criticism. Um, unlike the report itself, uh, I was, at least during the consultations, uh, voicing strong support for the creation of uh, what is admittedly sort of an unfortunately named Night Mayor, um, or Night Czar, Don Ambassador, whatever your preferred nomenclature. Uh, I really do think we need a point of contact that is not already busy with the regular nine to five, all the daytime issues that are uh, undoubtedly important um, and need to be addressed, but someone who can really devote themselves to uh, the after hours um, to understand that culture and that lifestyle as it is somewhat of a different one. Uh, someone who can really stand up and, and show the world and communicate with other leaders in other cities uh, to let the world know that we mean business in Toronto, not just, you know, from nine to five during the day, but also at night. Uh, I also think that um, the report alludes somewhat to uh, issues around zoning, um, and some of which I would, I would say uh, are perhaps overly restrictive with respect to uh, aspirational entrepreneurs who want to set up um, nightclubs or, or nightlife environments outside of the entertainment district BIA. But by and large, um, obviously I support the idea of continuing this dialogue, continuing an action plan, creating a program advisory committee, as well as tracking economic data, which I'm surprised is not already happening. Um, there's nothing in the report I really don't support. Uh, I just wish that it went a lot further and pushed the city, you know, as hard as possible to be the best version of itself 24 hours a day. Um, I've been fortunate as an artist to travel the world and see a lot of the great cities and perform in a lot of the great cities mentioned in the report, and I, I can say with relative confidence that we still are a bit behind. Um, and we're leaving money on the table by, by refusing to sort of confront this fact. So uh, I urge you all to, to read the report and uh, approve its recommendations. Um, as, as Elena said, if, if time of day is truly what gives a city its edge, uh, I, I, it's, it's in, in my opinion, to, to resort again to hockey metaphors, that we're uh, taking our sweet time with the skate sharpener, and we've got to, you know, get out there on the ice and make some moves. Okay, thank you very Thank much, you, sir.
Um, are there any questions for Mr. Reagan? Okay, there are no questions of you, sir. Thank you very much. Our next um, speaker is uh, Spencer Sutherland. Spencer is the uh, co-chair of the Toronto Music Industry Advisory Council. Spencer, you're no stranger to this committee. Thank you very much. I think you've been uh, very active in this space. Good to see you. I have, thank you. <clears throat> um, yes, the, uh, the report and, and the hard work done by Elena Boot and others is very much appreciated. She put uh, a great number of hours and, uh, and did uh, many interviews with myself and many others uh, in and around this, uh, this important sector. I, I really value the work that has been put into the report and, and I wholeheartedly agree with, with her recommendations. Though I do have some concern that it has uh, been two years in the making already and, and the call is for more time uh, planning, which is, which is needed but without uh, leadership uh, or uh, or any um, per se action at this time. I I think that the nighttime economy is very much a wild west. It is very much under rapid under threat by the rapid gentrification of the city, and and I I think it would behoove us to to try to move as quickly as we can in 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 putting towards some stewardship of what is the a wild west uh, economic sector. The there is already a um, <clears throat> there is already a project underway, as we know, that was endorsed by this by this committee in, in January. The the, uh, the project, the nighttime economy project, with the Responsible Hospitality Institute, that has been doing work in this sector for many decades, and uh, in partnership with stakeholders including uh, Tabia, the uh, Ryerson University, the Toronto Police, and of, and of course the the city. We're currently in the process of assembling a transformation team, and uh, and I guess what I don't see from from these recommendations is support for continued support for for for, for that program. And I think there was an opportunity for uh, stewardship and leadership in this sector um, by continuing to 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 reinforce the work that is already underway. And uh, okay, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Sutherland. Are there any questions for Mr. Sutherland? Okay, visiting members, no? Members of committee? Okay, seeing none, thank you. All right, uh, our next uh, speaker is uh, Janice Solomon from the Toronto Entertainment uh, District BIA. Ms. Solomon, good morning. You're no stranger to this committee. You have five minutes to speak. Good morning. Good I want to remind you, I was here probably 10 years ago talking about the Entertainment Commission out of San Francisco um, and what a great um, concept that was and the idea was that the entertainment commission um, was run out of the mayor's office and it was really uh, a one-stop shop for nighttime for the nighttime economy and um, what i recognize here so i want to start with um, thanking alana bird for her work on developing this very detailed report and her dedication to um, uh, hearing from a variety of stakeholders and interested parties. I'm pleased that this, recommend, this report recommends a vision and action plan or, or to proceed with the development of a vision and action plan for the nighttime economy. And I certainly recognize that my entertainment commission idea isn't feasible for the city. Um, and in the report, it states that um, they, uh, the report does not recommend adopting a nighttime mayor ambassador program for Toronto at this time. But given that I have a 10 year history <laughs> on this topic, what I really would like to see is the language in the report support a nighttime ambassador outside of the city, a responsible agency or body outside of the city that can be that representative of um, nighttime in, a, in an ambassador capacity and what this would require that I stressed in my conversations with Alana is that it really requires council support so that city staff when required whatever department that might be MLS police fire etc um, are very active in responding to this um, what's important about nighttime the nighttime economy is preserving it, protecting it, promoting it, policing it, and planning it. And that requires the city's support. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Ms. Solomon. Are there any questions for Ms. Solomon? 
Okay, seeing none, thank you. Um, members, um, did you wish to ask staff questions um, on this particular item? It's pretty clear. Okay, so members wishing to speak, we'll start with visiting councillors first. Uh, Councillor Kresge, please, you have five minutes. Uh, well, thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and uh, as one of the, the three downtown councillors and as a councillor for the entertainment district, I wanted to take the time to be here. And I, I do want to begin by thanking um, everybody who's been involved in the extensive consultations and process to this point, representatives in the industry, um, from culture to, uh, to the clubs, to the music, to the BIAs, to the many residents who've been part of it, um, to this committee for bringing this to the forefront, but most importantly to City of Toronto staff um, who have been on this, Zabe and Elena and Mike Williams and others, for, for two years now and are committed to this. I do want to, I won't take five minutes, but I do want to say a few things. Uh, we are, and this committee is, I think, tasked with more than any other committee making it so, a world-class city. And we are, and we see it daily, continuing to attract people to this region. And we're attracting people in the tech sector. We're attracting people in the cultural sector. We're also attracting people who want to live in downtown. And part of a world-class city is a vibrant and exciting downtown. It very much is. What I find interesting, and this is the trick with this topic of, of the nighttime economy, is the vision for downtown that we as a city articulated and implemented through our zoning is that of a mixed-use neighborhood. That was the very vision in 1996 for the Two Kings that was implemented as a mixed-use neighborhood where people live, where they work, and where they play, where they do all three of those. And I will tell you, as the, the councillor for 100,000 residents, many of whom live in that downtown area, that there are those residents, and I will say residents, who want to live in a residential neighbourhood, but it's a mixed-use neighbourhood. And I will also tell you, as the representative for many business operators and managers, that they want to, they want simply a club district. The answer is in the middle. And that's what's so important about the nighttime economy and getting it right because it's critical for a world-class city, is that we need, by our own design, to find the balance for a mixed-use neighbourhood. Don't expect silence, but also don't expect constant noise. That's the balance. And so I truly believe, and I thank the committee for their work on this, that we can and should do more as a city to promote the nighttime economy. Measures like we've taken as a city on cultural hubs, on tax measures, measures being taken with the leadership of TMAC, and thank you to the co-chair Spencer for being here around live music, looking at zoning issues, taxes issues, looking at all ages venues, which is a critical issue. Uh, looking as one of the recommendations in this report is to deal with the onerous and complicated and flawed process of 4 a.m. extensions that currently exists. I'd note we have a representative from Toronto Police Services here today where we have under provincial, provincial law a 2 a.m. closure, but under the city we can extend, as is our purview, to 4 a.m. But that process and how it goes about, it doesn't work for city staff, it doesn't work for the owners who are requesting extensions, it doesn't work for residents, and it really doesn't work for the police who don't know what's happening and when. And so one of the recs to clean that up is important. And so I will just close by saying that it is critical that we get the nighttime economy right. It's also critical, and I say this as a local councillor, that we get the balance right from our mixed-use vision. And, and I will say that with this committee's leadership on this file and our staff's constant diligence on it, I'm confident that we will get there, and I'm fully in support of the recommendations. And, and thank you, Mr. Chair, for championing this. Thank you, Councillor uh, Kresge. All right, um, Councillor Wong Tan. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and I also would like to echo uh, my own gratitude and thanks for the city staff for their hard work um, and very thoughtful work moving forward. Um, and to all the different stakeholders uh, who have been involved with the consultation process, um, I just want to add a, a few um, uh, remarks that I think will probably help us uh, 
expand the thinking uh, as this discussion and report goes forward to this next phase of work. Um, I recognize that in this report there is a lot of talk about the economy and, uh, and that a nightlife cannot exist without a consumer. Um, I think that it's important for us to recognize that the nighttime economy goes beyond nightclubs and dance music venues. Uh, it's also about making sure that residents have the services that they need um, moving forward. And that means probably extending library hours, extending arena hours, extending hours to other types of services, including recreation and parks. Because um, if we're talking about that nighttime economy, I would think that we would talk holistically about how we actually keep a city going 24-7. Uh, uh, yeah, and, and that brings us to services uh, that go beyond what the city does at its core, which includes um, transportation, transit. Uh, there's been a lot of work that's been done in my office uh, in conjunction and support with the BIAs about closing the service gaps downtown. We already have tremendous pressures in our public spaces and how do we make sure that they are as clean, as vibrant as they can be, especially since there seems to be very little time to keep them clean when the activity never seems to stop and the service levels that we receive right now are really the same service levels that we receive in other parts of the city uh, that have literally uh, one-fifth of the population and one-fifth of the economy and, uh, and pedestrian traffic and use. Uh, so I would only argue and, uh, and put this forward as we move, dis move this discussion forward is that the any discussion and thought about the nighttime economy has to be much bigger and broader than where we are uh, today. And so that means that the balance has got to be there. Uh, we have to make sure that we're respectful of the ongoing discussion that's happening concurrently with this one uh, with respect to the noise bylaw review. Um, and I would only put out one um, probably additional thought. And that is currently when we have um, people that come out of bars and restaurants that have been um, in concentration, uh, that have been drinking and consuming, uh, and then they're released onto the street as these venues close, it creates a very difficult situation in the social fabric of our communities because oftentimes those restaurants and bars and nightclubs are adjacent to residential streets or literally at the base of these residential towers and, uh, and that's where the friction has come about, how people queue up for, uh, for the, uh, the dance establishments, how, they're, how they uh, relieve themselves once the establishments are, are closed, where are the washrooms, how do you ensure it's properly policed. It goes so much more than just whether or not we extend alcohol service for two hours. Uh, I would be far more open to a discussion of how do we manage all of it uh, beyond just a two-hour extension. Perhaps it's no caps on alcohol service, and so therefore there is no pressure at all for having tens of thousands of people released onto the streets at four o'clock in the morning. Um, so I just want to put that out there because I think it's much more dimensional than, than what we have. Um, but I do, I am encouraged that where we are today uh, is, a, is a very good discussion. I, I hope that it gets bigger and I hope it gets even more dynamic and uh, we take in the, the multifacets of, uh, of what's, uh, what's before us, which is an exciting opportunity to really elevate uh, a, 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 an initiative that began several years ago. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Councillor Wong Chan. Uh, in uh, now take this matter into committee. Uh, Councillor Hart, first speaker, as committee member. Thank Councilor you, Hart. Chair. Uh, very briefly, Councillor Wong Tam said some of what I was about to say, but you know you have the most vibrant area of the city, and Councillor Cressy men mentioned live, work, and play. There certainly is no area in the city that's more live, work, and play uh, than than the entertainment district. And you know my experience in, in that part of the city. Uh, from uh, one of my previous uh, positions was that, you know, when you have thousands of people going out on the street, typically 2.30, 3 o'clock in the morning, you know, and, and you're in a residential area as well, you know, you have, that's where you have your noise issues, that's where you have your conflict issues, that's where you have your policing issues. And I think when the report comes back, there has to be a real hard look at some other cities in the world that have done a really good job of extending hours on a permanent basis and how that ends up playing out in terms of all those noise issues and conflict issues. And we really as a city have to look at all of the other services on a 24-7 basis that Councillor Wong Tam mentioned, in particular in that area of transportation. 
because you get a flood of thousands of people who are essentially trapped for a period of time because they've been drinking and they have no way to leave the area quickly because there simply isn't the service that's required. So a holistic view of that, but I think a really hard look at the hours of operation is essential. I know there are lots of reasons that staff can put forward why not to do it because there are challenges from a staffing perspective, but I can tell you I've seen it firsthand numerous times uh, from the enforcement side in MLS, and when you have all of those people come out at the same time, trust me, uh, extreme conflict, and that's something that the city really has to look at and, and spread out over a period of time, and I think the residents of the area ultimately, although would have some concerns initially, I think, will appreciate it in the long run. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Hart. Anyone else to speak? Okay. Um, yeah, just let me uh, add my voice. Um, I, I totally agree um, with uh, all that has been said, particularly, I, I think, um, Councillor one time, um, you, one time, you, you, you um, capture, I think, the essence as to this issue. It's, it's a bigger issue. It is much more complicated. And I referenced to uh, Mr. Sutherland, he said, well, you know, what's taking so long and, and why, is, why can't we just do this? There's a lot of other elements. This is not just about a big party in the downtown core and, and simply about alcohol and people drinking and so on and people relieving themselves on the street. It's about our infrastructure. It's about some fundamental tenant things that we need to address. You talk about transportation and so on. That's very important. But it isn't just simply about entertainment. There's a series of things, and, and Councillor, you pointed out about libraries and so on. There are places around the world where you can have access to library and other facilities because not everybody simply wants to go to drink and have a drink and be a big party. There are many other things scholastically and other things that people want to do culturally that people want to do and so on. We need to ensure that the foundation and the infrastructure is actually in place. Um, you know, I, I think it's unfortunate that we hadn't really put our minds to this quite some time ago, but now we are putting our minds to it. And um, I, I was in Amsterdam some time ago, looked at what they were doing there, and they've gone through a whole structural development and so on. Berlin's been doing this, and New York has just recently put in place a night ambassador, someone responsible through the mayor's office. London's been doing this and so on. So there are examples and models around the world, but clearly we always say that we have to make um, uh, decisions that's right for Toronto, and it has to be something that really fits our requirements and so on. And I think we'll get there, and this report actually provides some foundational um, elements for us to actually work work with. Um, the issue around policing, uh, this isn't really simply a policing matter. It's a variety of different elements that have to be brought in and so on. And I think that uh, the 24-hour economy is here. Um, it's been here for some time. We haven't really turned our mind's eye as we have to the daytime economy and so on because that's been the premise as to how we advance our economic development and our enhancement and so on. But as we've said earlier, this is no longer a sleepy Toronto. This is no longer Toronto, the you know town where it, it uh, you roll up the sidewalks at six o'clock and you basically pull the the shutters down and you say we're closed for business. That that's no longer our city. Our city is an exciting city and so on. And there are elements that we have to bring in. And this report and and certainly thank the staff and the time that's been spent and consultation. It doesn't go far enough. There need, needs to be more work to be done, and we've heard from the comments that have been made here today. Very strong and very good comments from members who are here, and, and I'm very appreciative of that. The, the staff are aware of it. I've had numerous discussions with the general manager. Um, I've had uh, uh, um, a discussion with Mr. Spezza, um, the, the director, who is uh, very aware and has uh, seen some of the cities around the world where they have actually implemented these types of um, of, of, of procedures to enhance the night economy around safety, around economic development, around the expanded services and so on. Uh, what are the requirement for us to invest? What are those numbers going to be? What, uh, what are those investments going to be? And so we have to actually get a handle on that. We, it's not a question of whether or not we do this. It's a question of how we do this. So it, it has to be done. So I'm, I'm, I too lend my voice in support and um, uh, want to ensure that this does come back as quickly as possible. We recognize it won't be coming back in 2018, but 2019 for those who will be here, 
you'll have to deal with this, but I think the staff will come back with a very comprehensive report, and I want to thank the staff members who have worked on this because um, a really good work has been done, and whether or not it's the nightmare or the nightmare, um, I don't know what that title is going to be, but it will be something that really befits our interests here in Toronto. So I'm going to simply uh, move that we adopt the recommendations that are in this report. All those in favor, opposed, that's carried. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, moving right along, I have ED 28.6. Thank you both uh, members of council. Thank you. Um, strengthening the running tourism in Toronto, Councilor Brakadakis, you've had held this item. We and we have a, yes, we, yes, well, we have a speaker as well. And uh, let me just get the name of the speaker. Six. Yeah, I don't have it here. Um, okay, I didn't have that on mine. Uh, Doug McLaughlin, are you here? Doug, please come forward, please, sir. Okay. Good morning, sir. How are you? Excellent. You will have five minutes when you're ready, sir. Please let me know and I'll start your time. You'll be able to speak and then members may question you if they so wish. <laughs> they question me. Okay. All right. Thank you, sir. Okay, I'm ready. Let's go. Okay. Now, uh, uh, take this as a bit, let's say, of a challenge rather than an insult because I'm not necessarily a patient person. And as far as I'm concerned, Toronto's Destination Marathon should be run in the year 2019. I am a realist and I know that won't happen, but 2020? Come on. Anyhow, a Destination Marathon is a marathon people want to go to. Places like Pittsburgh and Philadelphia, they have great marathons. There's no reason not to run the Pittsburgh Marathon. The only reason you would leave is because there's a reason to go somewhere else. And that's what we want to do here in Toronto, is make it a marathon that somebody will come from Pittsburgh or Philly or wherever. Now, uh, oh, wait a minute, oh, <laughs> quickly though. Well, one of my notes here, they had in your attachments relative to the report you've got and all of these bullet points. One of the ones I should mention, from that meeting, it says here there should be only one full marathon event each year in Toronto. That's not what we said. There should only be one destination marathon. Even in New York City, they have a fall and a spring marathon. It's just that the one's the big one, and the other one's just a little one in the spring. And uh, if you're into marathons, I might point out as well, one of the things about a destination marathon, even Major League Baseball makes concessions because this Monday is the Boston Marathon. And what happens is that the Boston Red Sox start their game at 11 o'clock in the morning so that the people in the stands can be out on the streets cheering on the runners coming in. This comes to the fact that as much as we do want to uh, get elite runners into a race to show that it's a race worth racing, the real stars of a marathon are the people, your friends, your family, your neighbors that run it. And these people come out of that Boston Red Sox game and the people they're cheering on are finishing four hours plus. They're not fast. And, and that's what happens in marathons. That's, that's why you can get two million people in the New York City Marathon spread along those 40 kilometers. And that's what we need in Toronto. One of the things we weren't so allowed to talk about at that previous meeting from which these points come was the route. I mentioned in, quickly in that meeting, the two marathons we have have terrible routes. One of the reasons Toronto can't be a destination, true destination marathon is because we don't have a, a true destination marathon route. We have to make it so that people can watch. We hide out, we run, we run down near the Portlands where there, if there weren't marshals, you'd never see a human face for six kilometers of running. Uh, you know, Councillor Kelly was here when I was here a year ago and it almost fell out of his chair when I mentioned I, that the finish for this marathon, if we're going to make it such, should run basically from something like Jane and Bloor right across Bloor Street to Queen's Park, finishing in Queen's Park. Oh my God, traffic. Oh God. <laughs> Oh, I hear it all the time. Already we're ruining traffic for six hours with the two marathons. You're just changing the, the thing. You're not changing anything in the sense, just the focus of it. And by running along Blue Street, people come out and <laughs> you're the Economic Development Council, money. The thing is, if, if you get 
you know, 200,000 people buying a muffin and a coffee at a Starbucks, you're creating about a million dollars in about five hours just without hardly thinking about it. So and that's aside from all the people that have come to the destination that are paying all those hotel rates and going to those restaurants, visiting the theaters and all the, the cultural events that we have. And the other thing, okay, I got to also make some we, we talked about, oh geez, I'm going to run out of time. Uh, okay, Toronto is a world-class city. Every world-class city has a world-class marathon, okay? So if we're going to keep talking about Toronto's a world-class city, then we got to have a world-class marathon. It's one week a year, it's easy to do, there's parts in place. As far as I'm concerned, we have the two marathons. You have a, a thing from Mr. Brooks here that he sent along. We have two marathons. Uh, it's, those in the industry know there's a lot of antipathy between the two directors of the two races. I don't really care between the two, whatever one blinks first. Spring or fall, let's get a marathon, let's get, we'll, we'll get uh, 50,000 runners running, we'll get millions of dollars in, and uh, I see no reason <laughs> to uh, not put some effort behind getting a world-class marathon in Toronto. Thank you very much, sir. Here are five minutes. Are there any questions for the speaker? Cool. Sure. Yeah. Sorry. So, so, you, so, okay. Let's start the time. Councilor Frank. Oh, it won't. It'll be brief. Um, so you, you were mentioning that the um, about attachment one, and that that you felt that that was an inaccurate reflection of the conversation that happened um, at the working group meeting. And I was wondering if you remember that the at the meeting. Um, it was a long list of recommendations. We didn't always agree on all of them, but people were allowed to actually put forward recommendations. In the end, we didn't vote. Do you remember that? Right, yeah. Okay, so that's what attachment one is. I just wanted to clarify that for you. That oh, okay. Well, no, it's just because, as I say, when I looked at it, it, it says only one, and it's, uh, as I say, well, the way, well, I yeah, tried to the, clarify it. Yeah, it's the long by, list. It's the yeah. long list. It wasn't a consensus. We didn't actually, in the end, vote on, on what we all thought about every single one. There, was, there were conversation pieces when people brought those, those recommendations forward. And that's all I just okay. wanted to... Oh, no, no, okay, I, I understand that. But that, that's why I made that point, though, because when I look at it, there's a sense that you could just, off the top, read and think, oh, we're going to bump one of these guys. No. Well, no, that's what it, it wouldn't be hard to get that out of that line. True, but if for, those, That's all I'm saying. for those that were at the meeting, those were just a long list. Yeah, but we've got four million people in Toronto and there are only two dozen people. Well, and that's so. the thing that we're having this conversation and I'm asking you the question because we were both at the meeting and, and yeah. we remember how it, how it shook down. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Thanks very no, no much. No problem. As long as we just have one destination marathon a year, next year. Thank you very much, sir. Thank okay. you, Councilor Frackdakis. Um, Councilor, did you wish to move the item or to speak? I, I did want to move the item and, and take this opportunity to thank everyone who came out um, to the working group meeting. I think it was a really great opportunity for everybody to come together to try to understand all the various issues um, that are out there. Um, and for the city and the various divisions that were present to understand that the the community's position about how they want to showcase our city um, and that they, they believe that our city has lots to offer. And in this committee, obviously, throughout the, the morning here today, we've talked about all that we have to offer in various ways, and this is just another way. And we have a series of running events that take place in this city, and, um, and some of them have like a tremendous economic impact, and it, they could have more of an impact, because I think um, as one of the speakers earlier, I believe it was the first one on, on the first item that talks about the confluence of events at this point in time has made this city in this country a really attractive place to be um, and people want to be here and partly because they can come here um, and that's actually a huge thing that, which is kind of sad in the 21st century that that's an issue but it's a thing so um, anyways I just want to thank staff for, for bringing this forward and, and I look forward to uh, the ongoing conversation because I think um, you know we have uh, a great opportunity because in 2019 there could be an opportunity for runners in the marathon here in this city to qualify for the 2020 Olympics in Japan. So I think that that could actually add another dimension to running in this city. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Councillor. So 
um, on the item. All those in favor, opposed, that's carried. Thank you very much. Okay. We are now moving to um, ED 28.7, de-assessing uh, and uh, transfer off the City of Toronto's uh, Lancaster bomber. We have a number of speakers. I have the first speaker on my list is uh, Lynn Barry, Save the Lancaster Group. Ms. Barry, I see a number of other people with you. Um, uh, may I ask when you sit down if you could maybe just give me the names of those people to ensure that they're on my list. So if you would mind before I start your time. I don't know if there's sufficient number of chairs, but there, if there isn't, maybe um, you may just want to pull a chair forward. Thank you. If you just maybe just give me the names if they're all on the list to speak. Uh, okay, go ahead, please. Mitchell, Tim Moles, uh, Brian Monroe, Richard Bannigan, and two were added. Okay, so I have that list in order. So what I'd like to do, it's not really necessary for everyone to come together at the same time, okay. unless you're speaking as a group. Okay, no, are you speaking, speaking as a group individually? Right. So okay. may I then ask? that I would ask you to be at the table. Okay. The other members, I will call you okay. at the appropriate time. I realize it's your first time here, but just have a seat and I will call you up and you will have five minutes as well. I'm sorry, sir? We'll have time to set up the PowerPoint. Yes, the staff will help you when your opportunity comes to speak. Yes, absolutely, sir. Yeah, okay. we'll afford you that opportunity. Great. All right, thank you very much. I realize your first time here, but this is just a process we go through. All right, uh, Ms. Berry, you have five minutes to speak. And thank you for being here. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to address the committee. I am the co-founder of Save Lancaster FM 104, a group of very passionate people about this particular aircraft. You have seen the various proposals, and I am here today to tell you that this issue is more than just about this aircraft. This is about the veterans of Bomber Command who flew in the Lancaster and who knew how instrumental the Lancaster itself was in helping the Allies to win the war. Yesterday in Lincoln, England, the International Bomber Command Museum was officially opened in front of 5,000 people. Among those people were veterans, along with their families, the volunteers and donors. I was planning to be at that opening to represent my grandparents and my mom, but because you see, this is very personal to me. My Uncle Jackie, Pilot Officer Robert John Westgate, was a tail gunner with 97 Squadron in Woodhall Spa. He was killed at the young age of 20 along with his crew on July 11, 1942. He is buried in Poland. There are others in our group who have either lost a relative who flew in the Lancaster or their father, grandfather, brother, uncle, cousin served and survived the war. Our relatives paid the ultimate price. They gave their lives for my freedom, and they gave you your freedom. You are sitting here today, elected by your constituents, who have entrusted you with making responsible decisions on their behalf. For this reason, the fate of this beautiful aircraft is what is motivating all of us to try and save her for the citizens of Toronto. You have the power to make a difference in the history of this city. This Lancaster is part of it. It's very fabric. It was built in Malton by skilled workers whose lives revolved around working for Victory Aircraft. These men and women put their hearts and souls into building this aircraft because they believed their contribution to the war effort was vitally important. They took pride in every screw and every bolt they put in place. They loved that Lancaster and all she stood for. Many communities in the Greater Toronto Area depended on Victory Aircraft for their livelihood and when it closed down, it caused massive unemployment for those populations. Toronto has divested itself of other important historical artifacts such as the Haida, the army tank and the guns which sat down beside the Lancaster and Coronation Park without any public consultation. We need to preserve every single piece of our history for future generations. Toronto is a world-class city. There are much smaller cities across Canada with museums and memorials which tell the story of the Lancaster bombers such as the one in Nanton and the one in Windsor. These museums are lasting testament to the brave men and women who flew in this aircraft, the ground crew who serviced it, along with family members whose relatives made the supreme sacrifice, or veterans who are still alive and would like to see this aircraft up close. We are losing our veterans every day. Each of them has a story to tell. We owe it to them to keep their history and service alive in the minds of Canadians. The City of Toronto has an enormous opportunity here to showcase our history. Seize this opportunity. 
There is space in Toronto which could house such a large aircraft. We would like to see a museum built down by the waterfront in Anukshuk Park, close to public transportation and easily accessible. This Lancaster had been partially restored after it was removed from the waterfront. Volunteers great, gave a great deal of their time to help with its restoration, and it does not seem right that the city would even consider deaccessing it. The Air Force Museum in Trenton recently moved Lancaster KB882 from New Brunswick to Toronto to complete her restoration. Think of the attention an aviation museum would bring to the city. People around the world would marvel at it. It could be displayed indoors out of the elements where, because otherwise it would further deteriorate it. The museum could also be a destination for educational school trips as well. Our design would include a viewing area for that purpose. Can you imagine what it would mean to them to see their beloved Lancaster displayed to her former glory in a safe place for all? We have the support of Senator Ann Cools in Ottawa, who would have been here to speak today. However, she had a private family matter which took precedence. We also have the support of the Bomber Command Museum and the National Air Force Museum. And Councillor John Campbell, who is in his ward today, so he unfortunately wasn't able to attend the meeting. We have been assured by the Minister of Infrastructure in Ottawa, who has confirmed that our group is eligible to receive funding for 40% of the cost of our museum building, with further funding coming from the Ontario Ministry of Infrastructure. We have a plan, we have a team, and we can deliver. Our group has grown to more than 1,250 people since I started in October, as far away as New Zealand and other countries where these veterans flew on this great aircraft. It is a Toronto treasure, and it would be a travesty to let it go. I guess I'm done. I wanted to read a poem, thank, but I'll just... Thank you. Edit. No, why don't you read the poem, please? It's a really beautiful give, poem, that's fine. and I really think... I'll give you a little bit more time to read the poem. Yes. Please. It's not a long poem. Okay. It, other people may have heard it. It's a very famous poem written by pilot officer John Gillespie McGee of the RCAF. He was an, actually an American, and it's called High Flight. Oh, I have slipped the surly bonds of earth and danced the skies on laughter-silvered wings. Sunward I've climbed and joined the tumbling mirth of sun-split clouds and done a hundred things you have not dreamed of, wheeled and soared and swung high in the sunlit silence. Hovering there, I've chased the shouting wind along and flung my eager craft through footless halls of air. Up, up, the long, delirious, burning blue. I've topped the windswept heights with easy grace where never lark nor even eagle flew. And while with silent lifting mind I've trod, the high untrespassed sanctity of space put out my hand and touched the face of God. Okay. okay, thank you very much. Are there any questions for uh, Ms. Berry? Okay, um, Ms. Berry, I'd just like to ask, and, and thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you for being here. I realize this is a very important issue to you. You've uh, describe to, uh, to us uh, what the actual impact is and the very personal nature of this particular issue. And uh, your group, um, Save the uh, Lancaster Group, uh, FM 104, um, there are um, certain costs associated certainly with respect to this historical piece, uh, not only as it relates to our history, but in terms of its continuance and so on. Um, what is uh, the group's uh, intention or how would the group be able to um, afford the maintenance of uh, and the restoration of this particular important um, historical and, 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 and um, uh, you know, uh, really important item as part of our history? How, how would your group go about sort of developing that plan. I haven't seen a plan from it's you. It's so. coming with Dan. It'll okay, be part enough. of his presentation, but um, just speaking to Ottawa yesterday, uh, they have confirmed that um, towards the end of the year, we are eligible. To, uh, there's a, a, a fund of $708 million, mm -hmm. which we could access, and they would provide up to 40% of the cost of the building itself. The restoration is another matter. Um, we have somebody here to speak today who actually uh, could go towards the actual details of the cost of the restoration itself. Um, it was partially restored, so because we have not seen it and we were not allowed to see it up in Edenvale, we don't know what state it's in, but um, there are various members who do and who worked on it, and um, that will be part of Dan's okay. presentation. Okay, fantastic. Thank you very much for your presentation, ma'am. Thank you. All right, um, our next uh, speaker, uh, Dan Grant. Dan, 
to come forward. And you have a presentation, so I want to make sure our staff is able to help you to get everything up in place. Uh, so before I start your time, I'll uh, get the staff to assist you, sir, so that you're able to provide your presentation to us. Thank you. Craig, are we good? Okay, fair enough. Okay. So I'm going to give you another minute, sir, and if not, perhaps you can just give us an overview as to your presentation. Okay, great. Are we good to go? Fantastic. Thank you, sir. Go ahead, please. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Economic development and culture is basically what we're here to talk about today, the City of Toronto, and Lancaster FM 104 just expounds all of those items. It is a part of the City of Toronto. We have assembled a group. All of our um, um, senior staff is here today to demonstrate to you that we have the group in place, we have a plan in place, we have a restoration plan, we have an operating plan, and as, as late as yesterday, we found out we had some money from the federal government to help us go towards that goal. But what we need to do is have a commitment from your committee for that aircraft so that we can move ahead and start the process. Now, we've, I've contacted seven <coughs> major corporations to become a corporate sponsor of this aircraft. And they're all waiting with bated breath to find out whether or not we can uh, put this uh, plan together. So yesterday again, we found out we have 40% of the cost of the building from the feds, federal to government, and we're gonna contact the provincial government as well now that we have that federal, federal commitment. If you look at my PowerPoint presentation, everybody has been provided with this presentation. Um, in fact, it was even online with your uh, agenda for this meeting. Now our group, has been transparent in every way. We are a public group. Everything that we have done is try to get the attention of the public to the fact that this airplane is, is owned by the public and belongs in the city of Toronto. I was born in the city of Toronto. I was raised here in the city of Toronto and I grew up with this airplane, as you can see, on a plinth down at Coronation Park, along with another uh, number of other items. Now, a lot has been said about the fact that it may be a military item. Now, in fact, while it was built as a military item and uh, built for another cause altogether, it actually worked in peace for 19 years in search and rescue, okay? And it was out there toiling the North Atlantic, looking for ships, dropping blood to people that needed it, that were hemorrhaging on a ship in the middle of the night, which one of my uh, uh, co-managers uh, will speak to, and it was there for us. Now it's our turn to be there for them. The uh, group has grown to over 1,250 members. We're supported by the Royal Canadian Air Force Association, the Toronto Historical Association, which is here, the Canadian Aircraft Preservation uh, Association, the Bomber Command Museum of Nanton, and yes, as late as yesterday, the National Air Force Museum in Trenton. Okay, we have the, the people, we're capable, we're dedicated, we're professional. We have the most experienced Lancaster restorer 
if not in Canada, the world, on staff as our Director of Maintenance, Engineering and Structures. And he is here today and he is going to answer your questions. The, uh, the plan is all laid out in our proposal and also in the manual here. Now, there's some talk uh, in the staff report that I'd just like to bring to your attention. And one of them is that KB882, the aircraft that was uh, now in Trenton, was originally supposed to go to Alberta. Now, Alberta won the, the, uh, the award from the city of Edmonston, New Brunswick, and unfortunately, they could not afford to move the aircraft from Edmonston to Edmonton. The cost was just astronomical. Now, as you know, the cost to move the aircraft from Pearson to Edenville was upwards of $40,000. Now, you can imagine how much the cost would be to move it to Vancouver Island from Edenville, based on those numbers. I've heard numbers as high as $500,000. Okay, it's not cheap. And if the aircraft cannot be moved there, uh, Alberta was unable to, to, uh, to um, to follow through with the transportation costs, therefore it went to the next, uh, the next uh, person on the list, which was National Air Force Museum in Trenton. And Trenton was able to go in with the Air Force, take the airplane apart and move it to Trenton, Tootsuite, because they had the you know, resources to do it, of course. So if the airplane goes to Edenville, we haven't seen anything in the staff report about the fact that uh, what is their plan, who are the restorers, how are they going to go about it, etc. So uh, I'm a little concerned that if the aircraft doesn't go out west... Okay, it's can you wrap it up, air. please, sir? I'll give, you, I'll give you 10 seconds to wrap it up. You're okay, at five just to wrap everything up, we have everything in place, we have, uh, we have a budget, we have the numbers, and uh, I'll okay. take your questions, no problem. Okay, thank you very much. Are there any questions for Mr. Grant? There are no questions, Orsi, sir. Thank you very much. Okay, our next uh, speaker is uh, Jane Mitchell. Ms. Mitchell. Ms. Mitchell, good morning, and you have five minutes. Good morning. To speak. Thank you. Thank you very much for um, having me speak. Um, just a brief bio professionally I'm a scientist. I have a PhD from the University of Toronto, and I spent 20 years working as a research scientist in government and in university laboratories. I then spent 16 years in regulatory affairs in pharmaceutical industry, so I have experience working in regulatory affairs with governments. I was introduced formally to, um, to this particular Lancaster when I was eight years old. I went to Bedford Park School in North Toronto. My dad pulled me out of school one afternoon to go to the fly-off at Downsview. This was the decommissioning of the Lancasters. I was very much in awe at this ceremony with my dad, my sister, and my mom, um, as the four Lancasters, including one F-104, flew straight up and circled around in formation. It was mind-boggling, ear-boggling, to say the, the least. My dad flew 70-plus ops and as a Pathfinder Navigator, both on Lancasters and Mosquitoes. He earned a DFC. He came home from Bomber Command with a love and a passion for aviation and for those he loved and served with, not for a love of war or military strategy. I know Dad never got over losing his Lancaster pilot, Mr. Burden Rowe. Burden Rowe and my dad flew over 20 trips on the Lancaster. Verdon Rowe was the son of A.V. Rowe, that is Avro. Dad sadly had impacted wisdom teeth as a 21-year-old. He was grounded for a few weeks and he was unable to fly the night that Verdon Rowe and his crew crashed. The Lancaster is an icon for many. The Lynn has already spoke to the families who lost loved ones, families of those who survivors, families of those who maintained and still maintained lovely, lovingly these planes, those at Victory and those in the museum, such as at Nanton and in um, Windsor. 
There are also, let us not forget, the families in Europe at the time of Bomber Command who saw, but most likely heard, those Lancaster bombers, hundreds of them, hundreds of them. These are the people in Belgium, Holland, Luxembourg, France, Germany, just to name a few. Many of those people are relatives or, or, or they are here as proud Canadians today and many live in Toronto. The Avro designers and suppliers who had inspiration and perspiration for the new technologies that were developed during the time that the Lancaster would, was developed. The Lan Avro Lancaster has brought so many people together. When I was a postdoc in Cambridge, the department head was a brilliant physicist. He died five years ago. His daughter told me that he had been a radar kid. These were like the 16, 17 year old kids who were developing and refining <laughs> radar. And they were flying ops in theater. My dad said they were everywhere. I never knew that Hugh flew Lancasters, but he must have told his daughter because my father passed away in 1986 while I was a uh, postdoc in England. And I guess, you know, she didn't know he'd never told me. For Lancaster Museum, for scientists like me, the LANC is a rich model for STEM education, discovery and learning. STEM is a big buzzword and acronym right now for science, technology, engineering, mathematics. We've heard this morning about some very, very elite science that goes on and technology that goes on at Mars. I was there a couple of weeks ago in one of the innovation sh showcases and I enjoyed it tremendously. My dad, as a navigator, was a crack mathematician. He had left second year McGill engineering in 1940. It was all about vectors, airspeed, slide rules, compasses, and hand computing, just the way they did on that movie, Hidden, Hidden Figures, that was um, about the, the early space program. There was no satellites up there when those um, Lancasters were first flying, so there was no GPS. I have a personal passion for aviation medicine, the effects in the body, oxygen use, medicines that were used during the war for long flights. I'll have to ask you to end it there, ma'am. We're actually at five minutes now, okay? Okay, well, let's uh, get it on Toronto and let's keep this Lancaster okay. for, for the future. Thank you, Thank very, you much. very much. Thank you very much. Um, members um, who are here to speak to this item, I have a number of uh, additional names. Um, I have to say that the recommendations that are here does not reflect your, your requests or your intentions. Um, can I see a nod of heads that people are, the recommendations here are quite different from what I'm hearing as being said. Um, are, are you in agreement that the recommendations are quite different? You're asking us to do something. Yeah, yeah so you're, 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 okay, so you're fine. So what I, I was going to make a suggestion with your permission is we are um, going to end this meeting at uh, 12.30. Um, and I'm afraid that we're going to run out of time. We have a number of speakers one, and you have a right to speak. We also have one member who unfortunately has to leave at 12.30 and we will not have quorum at that particular point in time. So it means that your matter may not be in fact be dealt with here today. And so what I'd like to suggest to you, because I'm hearing that there are additional information, one which is extremely important, I'm hearing that there are some federal funds that could possibly assist you in your intention and your desire. The recommendation does not really support what your intentions are, which is seeking to have um, the ability to have some time, to be able to develop your plan with resources and also then to make a business case to say here's what we believe that our group can do. Recognizing the importance to you and the presenters and the people here to speak to this particular issue, I'd like to offer a suggestion which would be to defer this particular item until a later date to ask you to work with our staff with respect to the new information that you're presenting to us here today, which does not form part of this particular report. Uh, if you don't wish to do that, we can proceed and go ahead uh, and have the speakers up to the point where, uh, I guess, members of the committee, if well, they have to leave, and we can say, 
um, this particular meeting is adjourned because we don't have quorum, or we can agree that uh, a date I'm looking at perhaps will give you enough time to be able to work with staff to come back in June, and that date would be about June 11, 11th, allowing you enough time to be able to have your further discussion with the federal government, to work with our staff, to work with your team, and to come back with a comprehensive plan that would actually speak to what you're saying to us here today. If you are in agreement with that, I'm proposing to make that particular motion. If you're not, that's fine. We can proceed and go ahead with what we have in front of us. So um, I would like to ask perhaps Ms. Berry, if I have you or Mr. Grant, both of you maybe want to come back to the table here and maybe just afford you the opportunity to speak to that. If you are in agreement, that's fine. If you're not, that's fine as well because that is your prerogative and the prerogative of all the people who have actually listed their names here to speak. You do have a right to speak and I will afford you that right to speak if you wish or you wish to compromise and basically um, basically speak to what I've just presented to you today. So maybe I'll just ask, ask you to have a quick seat, and members are just going to ask that just uh, vary the procedures a little bit. Can I join you? Please, absolutely, Ms. Grant. So that was one of the, the problems we had because we had, as Dan said, been very transparent. We had presented our, our actual PowerPoint presentation was part of the agenda that was online, but things had changed. So we phoned the city clerk, uh, the clerk of your committee yesterday and asked her to update it. And then literally yesterday morning I had this call from Ottawa, two calls. Senator Cools was going to come here, she couldn't. And then I got a call at quarter to six last night saying that this money was available, that it had been announced two weeks ago, so it changes everything for us. Right. And, and we need time. Mm -hmm. And, that, and I'm offering you that. That's right. Yes. right. And, and, in fact, and that's what we... Yeah. In fact, we're five months behind everyone else here. That's the other thing. We had yeah. to come out, we found out about this from a UK magazine in October, and we've had to play catch up all along, so uh, additional time would be certainly acceptable. Okay, and I'm presuming that's acceptable to all the members who had come to speak on this particular issue, because if it is, I will basically proceed with that. Sir, are you in agreement or not? No, my name is John Lewis, I'm the president of the British Columbia Radiation. Yes. We have come all the way from Victoria to, okay. to talk. Yes. And we are prepared to take the Lancaster right now. Okay. Fair enough. Okay, so thank you both very much. What, what I will then do, I will proceed. Um, so, I'm sorry. So if in fact your group, who is opposing to the gentleman who just spoke from British Columbia, is okay, I would ask to just vary things and allow the gentleman to speak and to uh, bring forward, because I am going to move the motion which I just said. Okay? Okay. Please. Fair enough. Fair enough. Please come forward, sir. Are you, Miss, are you Richard Finnegan? Yeah, my name is John Lewis. John Lewis, Mr. Lewis. Okay, I just have you now on the list. And you, are you here with Paul Frederico as well? Uh, no, my, no, I'm a... That's you, sir? Okay. Okay, so you know what, folks? Um, we're going to just proceed with respect to the way we are, uh, with respect to the agenda. And if we uh, unfortunately run out of time, we run out of time, okay? So, uh, all right, so uh, then I'll go back to my original list. I will ask then for Tim Malds to come forward. So I will let you speak later, sir. Okay, thank you. Mr. Malds, would you please come forward, sir? Point of order, Mr. Yes, of course, Mr. Uh, as a courtesy to uh, the, if we do run out of time, you people have traveled. Uh, they'll, they'll have enough time to speak, Council Graham. Okay, they'll have enough sure? time. Okay. Yeah, no, I, sure. I made sure. They're from Vancouver. Yeah. No, no, they have okay. enough time. To speak. All right. Please go ahead, sir. Well, good morning. Uh, my name is Tim Moles. Yes. M O L S, not E S. Uh, my history with, with Lancasters goes back, uh, unlike a lot of people, my family was bombed by Lancaster bombers during the, the Second World War in Eindhoven, <laughs> Holland. When my parents came to Toronto as immigrants, and my dad, who, who had no money, came two years ahead of my mom. Anyway, they, uh, they would always take us down along the waterfront. We lived in Etobicoke, but they would take us down to the waterfront, and me and my brothers, we would have fun throwing snowballs at this Lancaster bomber. Uh, fast forward for, to 
probably 1963 I, I, uh, or 64, somewhere in there. I was a little kid. I recall standing behind that plane while they cleared the engines out and what a racket the thing made. Fast forward 20 more years to 1983 and I got a job as an aircraft apprentice, which is an aircraft mechanic or an engineer, working on the Lancaster in Hamilton. I knew nothing of Lancasters and I, I didn't even put the two planes together at that time, but I became their chief engineer on that project, uh, crew chief, not chief engineer, there was a guy above me. And I saw that aircraft through from uh, basically a hangar full of boxes of parts to an aircraft that flew. And uh, the day we flew it uh, in late 88, it attracted more people to that event than the air show actually had that year in Hamilton. And it was like about 30,000 people showed up. And I remember they only brought two porta potties, so it was quite busy there. Um, you know, I, I uh, as an engineer, I, I went on to become a, a structures engineer. I also was the person who, who signed out that Lancaster bomber, so I'm here to tell you that I know how to put this plane back together. And I'm going to say that this plane belongs here in Toronto because there's a lot of history and a lot of families. It's here. This plane belongs here. This is the Lank for Toronto. Hamilton has their Lancaster. and. Uh, I was always amazed how, how they can rub that in, I think, and, and now there's one that was moved to the Trenton Air Museum, and I had a lot to do with that. I've had a lot to do with the Lancaster uh, getting going back in the Nanton Air Museum in Alberta. So I've had my hands on, on pretty much every Lank in Canada, including this one. I visited it in the 80s and stole parts off it for the Warplane Heritage Lancaster. Uh, I don't really, you know, I'm new to this group. They asked me what I thought and I said, you know, this plane really should stay in Toronto, somewhere in Toronto, in some capacity. And that's how I'm, you know, putting my, sorry, my services forward on this. And uh, that's about all I have to say. Okay, thank you very much, sir. Any questions for Mr. Walls? Okay, none. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, I'd like to then ask Brian uh, Monroe, 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 to come forward. Brian, are you here? Oh, Brian, you are here. Let me see. Thank you. Okay, Brian, you have five minutes. And, uh, this is a first for me, but at. Uh, I've got quite a long letter here that I've written, and I've, I've, I've titled it up, Saving a Piece of Toronto's History. And I was involved also with the Lancaster myself, personally um, putting parts together with a, a very high respected gentleman, Norm Etheridge, who's passed away. And I just feel that sometimes in life you have to stand up for what you believe in and be counted. And this is why I'm here. And there's a, uh, there's a gentleman, uh, a Lancaster pilot was at, uh, at the Toronto Aerospace Museum, which does still exist in paper, but has no home. And I'm a member of the, the uh, Toronto Aerospace Museum. And Phil Gray was the Lancaster pilot, and he's passed away, and he was very much in support of the, the gentleman restoring the Lancaster at, at uh, Dunsview. And uh, I'm sure he's up there watching us now. And uh, he even wrote the Queen to save the Lancaster and to save the museum at Toronto Aerospace. That was in the paper. But I'll just go on and read what I have here. And I'll start it off, do we care? Why is the city of Toronto planning and giving away one of Toronto's most significant historic artifacts that once graced the waterfront? We've talked that many times. On a pedestal in front of the CNE. This iconic Lancaster FM 104 bomber was such a pivotal plane to the Allies over Germany, again repeating myself, is about to be sent down the road, probably you never see again in Toronto. This aircraft was bequested to Toronto in pristine shape from the RCF to commemorate those who have come before us and served our country to preserve the freedom we have today. Because of our neglect and uncaring attitude, uh, do we have the moral right to sell it out the back door to the highest bidder? 
because one gives precious personal heirlooms to museums all around the world in memory of loved ones who have served their country, they don't expect the guardians of these irreplaceable artifacts to be disposed of in any way. It doesn't make sense as Canada's richest city and largest city to virtually give to the perceived highest bidder when this artifact was as a direct link to Toronto's history. There are three million reasons why FM 104 should stay in Toronto, as every, every citizen morally has a partnership in this airplane. We provide shelter, hotels, food, medical aid to street people from all across Canada who flock to Toronto, all funded by our tax dollars. We support and fund all kinds of special interest groups to the tune of millions of tax dollars. Wasn't $20 million specifically set aside last year for Syrian refugees? As a sanctuary city, we provide free all the amenities of living. Can we also provide a safe haven for this wonderful, irreplaceable airplane? Only petty cash, really, in terms of Toronto's billion dollar budget, or perhaps no money, would be needed to save this aircraft. It's not about the money, it's about saving for all future generations of all Torontonians this educational artifact that basically saved the free speaking world in World War II. To give long Toronto's Lancaster away is a complete absence of respect and dishonour for all those Torontonians who joined the RCF number, number one manning depot at the CNE and never returned. It posed majestically became derelict when no carrying maintenance by the city and was put in the care of the Toronto Aerospace Museum at Danger to begin its long road to restoration, become a feature of the museum. A dedicated group of non-paid volunteers contributed $1 million worth of skilled labour, 20,000 hours over 12 years, to get a quarter of the way down to the road to static restoration. When the museum was unceremoniously asked to vacate the former de Havilland Mosquito assembly line, that historic heritage building. Now we're fast forward to the present and now the City of Toronto has received various proposals to assume physical possession uh, of this iconic piece of Toronto history. 447 of these very same Lancaster bombers were built right here in Toronto at the Victory Aircraft Corporation, not in Victoria, BC. FM 104 is the last remaining remnant of that massive plant that employed 10,000 skilled aviation workers. Again, with no sight, no foresight, not even a hangar door was saved from the demolition of that historic building out at Pearson. It's all gone, completely. Couldn't this wonder aviation, here's my key item, a new item, completely. Aviation artifact be one of the key features of a Canadian air and land marine museum at Downsview. Similar to the Smithsonian Museum in Washington. They started off very small. Thank you, sir. Get... Thank you, thank you. We're at okay, five I'm minutes. Sorry. Thank you. That's okay. I know you had a lot to say. <laughs> We're just in the interest of time, we'll proceed. Yeah, okay. uh, are you. there any questions at all for Small? Yeah. 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 No? Okay, there are no questions to you, sir. Okay, thank um, you. Uh, we are now going to ask um, Sir Richard uh, Bennigan. Bennigan? Uh, he's a former XRCAF pilot and is a member of uh, Save the Lancaster. Well, uh, yes, I'm a member Good afternoon, of this, sir. I'm a member of this group. Um, uh, I am one of the very few living ex-pilots of FM 104, Toronto's Lancaster. I was born and raised in Toronto, uh, so Toronto is my hometown. I joined the RCIF at age 18, right out of Etobicoke Collegiate, uh, graduated with my wings in Gimli, Manitoba in 1962. And in 63, I was posted to 107 Rescue Unit, Torbay, Newfoundland, a search and rescue unit flying Lancasters. We had three of them. FM 104 was one of them. FM 213 in Hamilton was another. So I flew both of those uh, Lancasters. So. That's really all I want to say. I know you're running out of time. I'm, I, I'm basically, I'm here to say that this is Toronto's airplane. It's my airplane, and we'd be crazy to give it up. It's ours. It stays here. Okay. Thank you very much, sir. Are there any questions? Okay. Seeing none. Okay. We are now moving to uh, Mary Connolly, um, Edenville a Aviation Heritage Foundation. Sir? Good afternoon. You have five minutes. Thank you very much. I'll wait till you are seated, sir, and set. Before right. we, I'll wait till you're seated oh. before we start your time. 
I changed my glasses there. No worries. Let me know when you're ready. Ready to go? Yeah, pretty much. Fantastic. Thank you, sir. You have the floor. Well, good morning, uh, Mr. Chairman, councillors, and uh, city staff. May I take a moment first to express our appreciation to the heritage staff and uh, the most professional and courteous manner in which they treated us in our proposal throughout this entire process. I'd like to thank you all. My name is uh, Murray Conley. I'm chair of the board and uh, general manager of the Edenvale Classic Air or Edenvale Aviation Heritage Foundation. With me today is Mr. Mylan Krupa, owner of Edenvale Aerodrome, a director and CEO of the foundation. Mr. David Snedden is a foundation director and our chief engineer. As well, he is a board member of the Simcoe County Museum. Mr. Krupa is an owner and operator of a Canada-wide uh, company with offices in all 10 provinces. He is the Canadian distributor of a European aircraft manufacturer, a licensed pilot, and very much an aviation enthusiast. Mr. Snedden is an aircraft maintenance engineer with the highest credentials in both Canada and the United States, an advisor to Transport Canada in respect to licensing, maintenance, and operating regulations, a member of the AME Hall of Fame, and formerly the chief engineer with the Canadian Warplane Heritage Museum in Hamilton when they restored their Lancaster bomber to airworthiness condition. <clears throat> I'm a retired senior Air Force officer, a licensed pilot with hands-on experience in aircraft restoration, a director with uh, both 441 Wing of the RCAF Association and the Edenvale Classic Aircraft Foundation. I'd like to say that I was stationed once in uh, Greenwood, Nova Scotia in the late 50s. We had two squadrons of Lancasters, plus uh, several with 103 rescue unit. And uh, that was my introduction to the airplane at that time and has been a fond uh, memory of mine ever since. Collectively, we bring together uh, the, uh, to this endeavor a considerable amount of knowledge, expertise, and experience. Although EAHF uh, was formed only in, in 2017, there has been efforts to create an aviation museum at Edenville Aerodrome for the two years previous to that. The decision of the Lancaster <coughs> created the opportunity to ratchet up these efforts. Subsequent to filing our proposal, the Foundation has continued to further expand our plans for the future. The Lancaster decision decision aside, our focus is to collect several other aircraft to place on display. We are also in conjunction with others, planning for a cenotaph to be located at the airfield to commemorate our fallen citizens. <clears throat> a museum is also in the works uh, to support the aircraft displays. We feel that the strength of our proposal surpasses those of our contemporaries in the most uh, significant of areas. The very fact that the aircraft is currently stored at Edenvale eliminates the erroneous cost, horrendous cost rather, <clears throat> the British Columbia Aviation Museum, with all respect, will have to absorb moving the aircraft some 4,000 kilometers. Uh, as been mentioned before, the 113 uh, kilometers to Edenvale cost $42,500 to the City of Toronto. We have at our disposal a brand new 8,000 square foot uh, hangar, which uh, <clears throat> It will be used to carry out the restoration. This facility is adjacent to and readily accessible to the public traveling Highway 26 to and from Georgian Bay's recreation facilities and all of that holds year round. Our area has many volunteers with a background in aviation repair and handling that have come forward to offer their services. Plus there are many more volunteers with a simple craving to assist with such an important artifact. It cannot be emphasized enough that we are fully funded to carry out this restoration to the end of the restoration and beyond. This advantage means that we can devote all of our efforts and finances to the restoration process. Of significance as well is the fact that as a sole source funded project without any public monies involved, the spin-off advantages to the local communities and the increased awareness fostered by the Lancaster as a major part without any expenditures on their part. Monday of this week, uh, ground was broken at Edenvale in preparation for a, a large terminal building. This two-story structure with an enclosed 
glass on the front and half the sides, <coughs> excuse me, the main floor of which uh, will be taken up mostly with space in which to, it is planned to display the Lancaster in all of its glory. Sorry, sir, we're at the five minutes, so um, okay. I have to ask you to end it there. This is a facsimile I got yesterday, a rendering okay. of the facility, if you wish to have a look. Uh, okay, no problem. Perhaps you can give it to the clerk, sir, and then maybe she can circulate it uh, to yes. the members. Okay, our next speaker Thank is, uh, sorry, are there any questions for Mr. Conley? Okay, seeing none. Our next speaker is John Lewis. Mr. Lewis, can come forward, please, sir. You have five minutes, sir. And I see you have a number of pe folks with you. I don't know if I, I don't think I have the I'm names of those. I'm not going to speak, but they're prepared to answer questions. Fantastic, sir. Is, Thank you. Um, I'll wait till you're seated, sir, before I start your time. On my left is Mike Ingram, who is the president of Victoria Air Maintenance. And on my Welcome. right is Associate Grant Hopkins. Welcome. My name is John Lewis. I'm the president of the British Columbia Aviation Museum. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to speak in support of our proposal. I will try to be very brief. No problem. Um, the museum has been in existence for 30 years. During that time, we've grown to a collection of more than 25 aircraft displayed in three hangars with a total floor space of more than 25,000 square feet. We're in a solid financial position with current cash reserves close to $200,000. And I should say, by the way, that we do have a quote to move the Lancaster to BC that is well within that range. We own our own buildings. We have a long-term lease for the land from the Victoria Airport Authority, uh, which we have the uh, ability to renew. We have excellent relationships with the Victoria Airport Authority, and in fact, there's a letter of support from them in our proposal package. Uh, most of our aircraft have been restored by museum volunteers, and in many cases, from basically piles of scrap. So we have a lot of experience in restoring aircraft. We're realizing that restoring a Lancaster ultimately to flying condition is a step up for us. It's a very significant project and it's a very long time frame. And so a key feature of our proposal is our partnership with Victoria Air Maintenance. The AM is an internationally recognized professional aircraft restoration organization, also located at Victoria International Airport. Uh, in fact, their hangars are about 200 meters from ours. Uh, they have a long, successful record of restorations. Uh, recently, you may be aware that they restored a de Havilland Mosquito to flying condition. We've had a long relationship with VAM. Both Mike and Grant are, on, are life members of the museum. Their involvement and supervision of the project ensures that all restoration work will be carried out under their control and according to Transport Canada's Approved Maintenance Organization Maintenance Policy Manual, properly recorded and verified. Our ultimate goal, and we realize it's a long-term goal, is to restore the aircraft to flying condition. Uh, it would be an honor to welcome this iconic aircraft to our collection. Um, and I, mu I must make a couple of comments about what I've been hearing before. Um, I find it personally extremely offensive that only the citizens of Toronto are worthy of knowing about Lancaster's and the sacrifices of Lancaster air crew during the war. Six group air crew came from all parts of Canada and died in their thousands in the strategic bombing initiative. The Lancaster also served significantly after the war on both coasts, including at Comox in British Columbia. Uh, and I can't resist making one other comment, which is that the Toronto aviation enthusiasts have had seven years in which to do something about the Lancaster, during which time they have done exactly nothing. We are ready to take the Lancaster immediately, and we're fully confident that we can restore it ultimately to flying condition. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Are there any questions for uh, Mr. Lewis and uh, his team? Okay, seeing none, thank you. There are no questions. Thank you very much. Uh, our next and final speaker is uh, Paul Federico. Mr. Federico, would you come forward, please, sir? You have five minutes, sir. I'll try and fit all my comments in on that. My name is Paul Federico. I'm the president of the Toronto Historical Association, which represents 12,000 volunteers across the city dealing with natural built and cultural heritage. The Lancaster bomber obviously falls under both as a built heritage and as cultural heritage. It was given to the city 
by the people of Toronto as a symbol of their effort and their sacrifice during World War II. It was put at the Ontario Place area there to be adjacent to Coronation Park so that it would reflect the earlier generation's commitment to the park itself as a memorial to their efforts during World War I. Everything that speaks to the history of this plane speaks to Toronto. I am not going to cast any aspersions on Edendale and, and the, uh, the people from BC. They are all well respected and competent people, but ultimately the plane will not be for the benefit of Toronto. I doubt that the people from BC are going to stick a plaque on it that says this plane came from Toronto, they didn't want it, but we've got it and we restored it and we're flying it. Thank you very much. This is Toronto's legacy. This is Toronto's heritage. It was given to Toronto. So much of Toronto's history uh, in all its forms is being eliminated through neglect, through ignorance, through just indifference. Um, it is not the city's uh, to give away without the people having a say. It was, uh, it's part and parcel of our history. Built here, flown by people from here, it belongs here and it belongs to where it can be seen. Not to demean the efforts of the group that presently have it, but their predecessor groups, um, through no fault of their own, lost places because other levels of government decided that their philosophy and their point of view was to commercialize uh, Downsview rather than to preserve Downsview. We're now in the position where Bombardier is going to get rid of the last vestige of uh, aviation history up there. I'm sure that'll become condos and uh, mega malls and all kinds of stuff eventually, uh, and that's going. We, uh, we're seeing too much of our history and our heritage in the city disappearing. And although uh, there's not much we can do about it in terms of finances because uh, we hear about it far too late, I am sure that if this was an issue of the bike lanes or other things, there would be a lot more groundswell. Uh, I would recommend that you give the present group, the Save the Lancaster group, the opportunity to put the viable financial plan in order, and then you can see all three options together and make an ultimate decision. That's your purview. Uh, but you must, in the, the long run, look at this as part of the history and heritage of the city. This is an emotional issue. This is not dollars and cents. As a line item, this is very minuscule in the city budget. And uh, lots more has been squandered uh, under previous administrations and this one uh, to, to see this relegated to, to somewhere else where it doesn't have any specific re relevance. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, sir. Are there any questions uh, for Mr. Federico? Okay, seeing none, there are no questions of you, sir. Uh, members, uh, questions of staff? None? Uh, and members to speak? Okay, none? Okay, I'll speak, I have a motion. Ask the clerk to put the motion forward, please. I can't see it on my screen, I think my screen's off. <laughs> it's okay, I'll just read that. So, uh, members, my motion is that consideration for the, this item be deferred until uh, July 9th, 2018 at the uh, Ex Economic Development Committee meeting to allow the General Manager uh, of Economic Development and Culture to explore new funding, uh, new opportunities for funding, which we, we've heard about here today. Um, you know, I, I have to weigh all the sides. I think that... Um, uh, in uh, Mr. Lewis's uh, remarks and the team that he has brought in here from, um, from Vancouver, I think that has to be uh, strongly considered and uh, that their expertise and experience certainly uh, would assist in restoring the uh, Lancaster bomber. I have no doubt that that is a uh, strong consideration and that is something that can be done and uh, if um, provided with the opportunity you could do so and we as Canadians could all be very proud of this bomber, uh, whether or not it's in uh, Victoria or elsewhere in the country as you pointed out. Uh, many have lost their lives with respect to the involvement in the wars and so on and this particular um, piece of our history is something that um, should be saved. So we weigh the balance. There are two groups in essence, uh, groups that wish to save this particular piece of history. One's on the west coast, east coast, and so on. And we've, um, 
uh, heard that there are certainly strong expertise uh, that's been suggested on both particular sides. I'm um, guided by the information that's been presented. I don't have any way of testing it other than to allow for time to come forward to assess whether or not there is appropriate federal funding that would be able to assist the group who has um, the FM 104 who have suggested that there is resources and they'd like to have the time and so on, they have a plan. Um, what I'm actually um, uh, buoyed uh, about is that there are two groups of Canadians who are wishing to save Canadian history. And I think that is a, 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 a good thing. Uh, it's laudable, it's applauded, and so on, and it is something that resonates with me personally as a uh, former uh, sea cadet who actually spent a lot of time at uh, HMCS York where the uh, bomber actually was as a young boy uh, growing up. And so it has uh, uh, some fundamental interest to me as, as a as young person and as a man today. Um, and so I'm a little bit aware of the history. And so the motion seeks to provide um, an opportunity to hear about the new funding opportunities and so on. And if at the end of the day uh, it isn't realized, then I'm afraid that the recommendations that are here is going to stand and that uh, we will see the Lancaster bomber going to Victoria to be enhanced and developed and to be put into a position where it can not only be secured for Canadians, but it will be part of our history. And whether or not it's located in Toronto or Vancouver, for me, it really doesn't matter, as long as it's located. And I am a Toronto councillor, so I should be all things Toronto, which I am. But I'm simply saying if the group from Toronto is not able to realize the opportunity to enhance it and do what needs to be done, then I think uh, another group from some part else where in the country should have that opportunity and so on. So I'm just offering an opportunity of some time to allow uh, our general manager to work with the group. But if it is not able to realize at that point, then we will resort back to the recommendations that are here. So the uh, item will still stand. And so uh, members, I'd like to just, uh, just um, um, uh, basically move that uh, item. And then I'd like to ask for a quick motion to extend for a couple of minutes, Councillor Fragadakis, I know you have to go. So that is my motion on this particular item. So I'm moving a deferral on till July 9th. And so anyone wishes questions or to speak to this particular item? If not, I will simply ask uh, all those who are in favor. Opposed, that's carried. So this item will be deferred until July 9th. Parties who have matters to deal with on this item will have no and motion to extend and to deal with the last item. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, so we are now moving to ED 2811. Uh, 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 it's a uh, motion from Councillor uh, Layton. We have a speaker on that particular item. We have Dion, Dionca uh, Gia Adele. I, I don't know if I pronounced your name properly, ma'am, but perhaps you can help us. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, good afternoon. My name is Dianca Goodell from the West Queen West Business Improvement Association. I'm here today to speak to you. Sorry, about uh, just a moment, please. I just want to make sure I can hear the speaker, folks, and I know that you can maybe you have your conversation outside, and perhaps I'd encourage both of you guys to maybe talk, but uh, please continue, ma'am. Thank you. Certainly. Um, I'm here today to speak to you uh, on behalf of the 225 businesses of the West Queen West BIA concer concerning the exorbitant cost of the hydro wiring covers and how it's negatively impacting our businesses. It's affecting the neighborhood beautification, which is just not happening. Businesses will start to close, but most importantly, it has caused grave safety issues since members are not able to assess the, the uh, condition of their facades. The enormous cost is prohibiting members from even doing an audit on the condition of their facades, never mind doing any work. One member said that they had nightmares worrying about pieces of their building falling and hurting someone, but they could not afford the $19,000 hydro wire covering fee just to check out the facade. During the recent windstorm, many members shared their concerns around safety. With climate changing, windstorms are no longer unusual and will continue to negatively impact an already tenuous situation. 
Parapets are very susceptible to damage and they are scattered throughout Queen Street West. They are a structural component to the original buildings and require routine maintenance, but that maintenance isn't happening due to the outrageous costs of the hydro wire and covers. The question we as a board are being posed is with the, with the changing climate, safety issues are not about if, but when someone gets hurt due to falling debris. Must something that dire happen before the city intervenes? The city should look at taking that cost up themselves through competition or internally addressing it. Fully understanding these safety issues and speaking with qualified professionals concerning this matter, we were told that costs can certainly be lowered if there was competition. Currently, there exists none. It is a monopoly. Secondly, it can definitely be lowered if it's brought back to the city and the city does something to recover costs. Our members believe this is something the city should cover and take on as a cost recovery. One member needed to clean and repair their bricks. The cost of the repair was 22,000, the scaffolding 10,000, and the covering of the wires 43,000. With taxes, it cost almost 100,000 to do a $22,000 job. No sm small business has that type of money. Even cleaning their windows, a $300 job becomes a $14,000 job after they have to cover the wires. So there is no way to clean the accumulated debris from all the construction and public transit that travels on Queen West. What would amount to $19,000 a month mounts to $228,000 a year just for monthly maintenance. So these jobs aren't getting done. If a member gets tagged on their facade, the city bylaw requires that it be removed. What happens if a business is tagged three times in the same month, which has happened? The cost is unconscionable, costing in the tens of thousands each time due to the cost of wire coverings. The small business owner is bounded with costs that are closer to 100000 which is absurd and not workable. The City of Toronto offers a fantastic facade improvement program where they share up to 50% of the cost of up to 10000 But when it costs over 20000 just to cover the wires, it's too expensive to do the work and take advantage of the program. Consequently, our members are taking a pass. Our members want to keep the neighbourhood beautiful, but we can't with these prohibitive costs limiting accessibility. Compounded with our safety concerns, many of our members are wondering in 10 years what this district will look like. Funding currently comes from the province concerning Toronto Hydro, and they need to know how abusive Hydro has been with those funds, perhaps holding back a portion to subsidize what is happening to these small businesses. If we don't do something, the city is going to be faced with huge safety issues concerning the wear and tear of these century-old buildings that currently cannot be addressed due to the unwarranted prices that Toronto Hydro is charging. If people can't take care of their buildings, we're going to lose the beautification, and you can't expect these small businesses to spend anywhere between 14 and 19,000 a month for basic maintenance, or even annually, just to check their buildings. If costs don't get lower, things are going to get bad and quickly. They are currently in a delicate state. Historical buildings require far more upkeep than modern buildings, and to prohibit the owners from doing basic upkeep by shackling their hands with exorbitant costs of covering the wires is illogical <clears throat> excuse me, and undermines incentive programs like the facade improvement plan. Small business costs have reached another end of the pendulum with the increase in commercial taxes, raising utility rates and a host of other expenses imposed, both provincially and municipally. It's unfair to ask them to pay these enormous prices when they could invest that money instead into the facade of their building which would be to the benefit of the community and the city and would assist in lessening the liability that currently exists. This needs to be addressed. Currently, we are killing... Thank you, ma'am. Five minutes. Thank you. All right. Are there any questions for our speaker? Okay. Seeing none, um, to speak. Council Rackenax. I was going to move the recommendations in the letter. It's, it's a great letter. It's, it's a serious problem. It's, uh, you know, I mean, telling me if you cost you $300 yeah. to clean your windows, but with the hydro covers, it comes out to $14,000. It's a little extreme. So obviously we have an issue, not just in, in your area, but in yes. all the areas, since we're up to about 82 or 85 <coughs> BIAs or some such number, it's uh, onerous for uh, people. And, uh, you know, the people are just trying to get by. So. I totally support this uh, report so back. Um, yeah, we're, we're in full agreement, so we will do what we can. It's kind of like the locates, right, that we dealt with that some time ago at Council. All right, so members, uh, the item, all those in favour? Opposed, that's carried. Motion to adjourn, Councillor Hart. All those in favour? Opposed, that's carried. Thank you very much to the amazing staff team of clerks and to the amazing men and women and general manager for EDC. Thank you.
All right. Have a great Friday uh, the 13th and a great weekend, everybody. Thank you very much.